meeting of the Water Planning Committee to order Tuesday, May 12th, 2015 at 6.30 p.m. Now we take roll call. Chairman Columbia. Here. Vice Chair Batter. Here. Here. Committee member Hinman. Here. Committee member Cashin. Here. Committee member Cashin. Here. Committee member Zenich. Here. Alternate Mike Cosby. Here. Alternate Zenich. Great. Full House. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. The first item on the agenda is to approve the draft minutes from the regular water planning committee uh, meeting held on April 14, 2015. Can I have a motion and a second to approve the draft minutes? Discussion, Mr. Chairman? <coughs> after, after, the motion. after the motion. My apologies. I'll make a motion. Uh, okay, so I have a motion from committee member Sh uh, Scheid. I need a second. Uh, I have a second from committee member Passion. <coughs> okay, now items is open for committee discussion. Without objection, Mr. Chairman, I would like my remarks on page five to be amended. Hold on one second, please. Point us to the you're talking about the whole paragraph? I'll just ask to the first sentence to be amended. Go ahead. Committee member Minerick asked about the cost estimates provided and whether these were firm or had significant variance. That was the point of my question. I think the committee was alarmed to hear the answer was that there was significant variance in the estimate as well, by the way. But I won't quibble with the rest of it. Because other members may not have a different recollection of what was the answer, but I know what my question was. Any other discussions? Do this all over again, maybe? Okay, vote is amended. All right, so I need to have a motion to amend amendment a uh, minutes. Can I have a motion and a second to approve the amendments? A motion. Okay, we're I have a motion from committee member Scheid. And a second from Thank you, Leonard. <laughs> a second from uh, Passion. I have a motion myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 <clears throat> All those opposed say nay. Motion carries. <clears throat> um, now you need a motion on the minutes themselves, don't you? Wasn't that just on the amendment? It was on the amendment, yes. Okay, let me get back. Okay, we've already got or, Yeah, you need the vote on the minutes themselves. Is what it, <laughs> right. You so, you're right, you're it. correct. Thank you for reminding me. So we did have a motion from committee member Scheid and a second from committee passion. So um, we'll go back to that. Yep. Good. Okay. So all those in favor on the <clears throat> on the minutes on the minutes amended, amended minutes amended minutes. Amended. Apologize. <clears throat> so um, we need a vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. So the motion carries. Thanks for pointing that out. Mm. 
Okay, now it's time for citizens who would like to address the Water Planning Committee. Are there any speakers, uh, speaker cards? Two? No? Okay. None. Oh, okay. Does anyone in the audience wish to speak? Quiet group tonight. We have no old business on the agenda for this meeting, so let's move on to new business. I'll turn this over to facilitator Teresa Manikin. Thank you, Chairman. All right, I'm going to stand once again so I can see everybody and everything. Um, let's see, so we're going to go ahead and give our brief intro about where we've been, where we're going, kind of remind everybody what you've heard and where we're going, the direction of the committee. I just need a... There you go. Thank you. All right. Okay, once again to the timeline. We've showed this every time just to kind of remind us where we've been, the things we've heard, the evolution of where we're going to. Right now, um, we're in the May, June timeframe, talking about the formulation of um, the utility rate recommendations, and we're going to have a lot of discussion on that, at least the beginning of a lot of discussion on that tonight. And then I'll move to next week's meeting as well. Finally, for the June-September timeframe, we're looking to be at a council work session, and that date is uh, scheduled for June 14th, I believe, and then have the community meeting in June, and then the 60-day notice period, council adoption, and then the new rates would become effective in um, January. Any questions on where we're going? All right. So here's the calendar dates just for your records. Uh, and so everybody knows we have the meeting tonight. We have the meeting next week. Does anyone have any challenges with that date for next week? We're hoping not. Anyone? So everybody should be able to be here? That's awesome. Okay. And then once again, all these dates, the council work session, the community meeting, the notice. I just went through them, but you have them there for your information. Okay. So tonight's meeting is, a, once again, a lot of information. Um, you have the PowerPoint that you can look at, but there's a lot of information to go over tonight. So we're going to go, I believe there's some breaks at various times where um, we can stop for questions. So that if you don't mind taking some notes and kind of jotting down your question, and then we have some predetermined breaks where we'll stop and say, okay, any questions on the material you've heard thus far? Will that work okay for everyone? Now we're kind of quiet. We're digesting our pizza. <laughs> so, um, and then the, then the discussion begins tonight. This will be the first part. Of, of the discussion to kind of, you know, figure out where we're going with the recommendations. And then the May 19th meeting, we'll further refine that and then um, vote or figure out how we get to kind of the, the meat of the finality of the recommendations. I am now going to pass it over to Bob. This is you, right? That's me. All right. Thank you. We have, uh, we've talked uh, quite a bit about water facilities, infrastructure, water resources. Uh, we're, and we touched on rates as far as methodologies. Today is really where you see it all being pulled together. There's been a lot of interest in water, uh, both locally and uh, in the Southwest in general. And these are some of the things that, uh, that we have seen. I'm sure you've seen this, this also in the past few uh, months and past couple years. California drought, these are headlines that uh, have been topical. California's issues. Mm. More in terms of California. I was just at Northern California, and uh, one of the guides that were there were on a rafting trip. He said, what, what's the situation in Arizona? And briefly talked about what, where, where we are in terms of we're probably not to this extreme stage yet, but they are, and they feel it, and they're beginning to react, as you've, you've read in the news. And the brown lawns are now the, the topical conversation there. In Lake Lake Mead, there's also that's that's our indicator for the area that uh, you're all well aware of. Uh, that's down to very low levels. It's probably at the lowest point the, since they begin measuring it. Mark Holmes in the past has given you quite a bit of information on the shortages in the Colorado River. Now the relationship that that has to our uh, cap water supply. Then Arizona, you, we're also seeing these headlines, maybe not in such a dire strait, but uh, also as, as much in concern. Uh, this month uh, is really the month where the, the results of this committee's work will really be uh, felt. Uh, we, we are looking for comments 
uh, both mm -hmm. in the discussion today, leading up to your recommendations or, or city council consideration, uh, really to put a stamp on the value that you see in the efforts that have taken place to date. And also, uh, if, if there are things that uh, you agree or disagree with. Make, I'll make uh, just uh, remind uh, all of you that there, there are other cities that have um, either in the process of rate increases or have made rate increases uh, to take effect in their communities. Uh, I have Av Avondale, I have uh, Buckeye, Gilbert, Mesa, which is proposed with the fiscal year 16 language. Uh, Peoria just awarded a contract for a water and wastewater rates analysis and study. Surprise put in, a, I believe it's a five, or possibly a longer uh, rate increase, schedule rate increases. And Scottsdale has uh, also uh, proposed within their fiscal year 16 budget uh, rate increases in the water and wastewater system. <clears throat> We've said this before, and uh, we, we only say this in the, 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 with the intent to try to, to, to help you understand as far as what your comments are going to mean to this study. Uh, some people in the committee have a greater awareness of the water, wastewater business. Others have less, but you have other points of concern that you've raised over the past few meetings that suggest that you have a different perspective. That's what we want to hear. Your perspective, different perspectives on this committee, really, as I mentioned earlier, will, will add value to, to what we're trying to accomplish here. As we said before, the comments uh, that we take from this meeting and the meeting following will help guide the staff and the administration put together a rate recommendation. When the rate recommendation will go before city council, You'll be asked, invited, and, and hopefully you'll be able to attend that meeting to participate in that discussion, or at least to hear the comments of the council. Uh, and, and the comments that you make, uh, pro, con, things we should have included or would, would, would you like to have seen. I think water conservation was uh, brought up a number of times, if that's in or to what degree we, we present that. Those are all issues that are important for you to communicate through this process and to city council uh, to, to, to really show them that what you're advocating are really points that <clears throat> the rest of the community are concerned about. So that's the importance of uh, your honest and frank comments. And the outcomes tonight. Um, as, as Teresa mentioned, there'll be a, a presentation that uh, we'll look for questions, your comments or questions at the end, but really following that discussion is really where our staff will be available to really answer any questions. If it's in finance, Larry, myself, or our, one of the, either of the marks uh, to talk about the things you've hear, heard over the previous ses session. And we have members from Curlo, uh, the consultant, also here. So everything's uh, open for discussion at this point. And we hope this presentation uh, ties it in together for you. The questions that I've got on the screen are what we've talked about also. The equity of, of these rates, are they equitable to all customers? Uh, are they sustainable for the, for, for the future? Are these going to, to uh, address the issues today and looking toward in the future? And from what you've heard, is the rate plan, does it hit the mark? Is it... Is it uh, uh, where it needs to be in terms of meeting critical needs. And then finally, as I mentioned earlier, have we missed anything? I uh, look forward to Dan's presentation tonight and equally to your comments uh, going forward. So with that, I'll pass it back to Dan Jackson. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, members of the committee. Um, as Bob indicated, my name is Dan Jackson. I'm the managing director of uh, economist.com. I'm here with my uh, associate, Jolyn Rains principal consultant of Economist.com. We, uh, along with uh, Becky Schaefer and uh, one other person at Economist.com, have been in charge fr from the beginning of uh, developing the long-term rate plan for uh, the, the city of Goodyear. Um, it's been a long process uh, that 
you all uh, have been involved in. We, we started this process even before uh, the committee was formed because we were helping the city identify and try to react to and plan for some very major events that are occurring here, not only here in uh, Goodyear, but around the rest of the state of Arizona and around the rest of the country. Um, this is an issue that a lot of people don't think about a whole lot, water resources, uh, water supplies, water costs. But as we're all finding out, and you have found out as in your service to this committee, it's one of the most important issues that any city will face. Cities don't survive without water. Um, in Texas, we have a saying uh, where I come from, uh, whiskey is for drinking and water is for fighting over. And I think that uh, the statement has never been more true than it is today. Water is truly the oil of the 21st century. Cities that properly plan for their water resources are the cities that will survive and prosper in this century. Cities that pretend this issue doesn't exist or ignore it or defer it or hide from it are the cities that are going to struggle in the new century. It's not an easy set of decisions that you faced here. It's not, an easy, uh, not easy by any stretch of the imagination. But take comfort in the fact that the decisions you make will have a positive impact on not only yourselves but future generations of people in this community as well. Um, it's one of the things that really drew me to the water industry when I first began, understanding that in this changing industry, we all have to face up and make a series of very difficult decisions. But by making those decisions, we're making not only our lives better, but we're making our children and our grandchildren's lives better as well. That involves costs. That involves investment. It involves planning for the future. You've heard a lot about that in the last several meetings with regards to the presentations made by staff and by Corolla about what needs to be done in order to secure your water supplies in the future. Well, now's the night we're going to talk a little bit about what the financial impact is. Um, in this presentation, uh, it, unfortunately, it's a little longer than I hoped it would be, but I think the information in here is very important that we go through. I'm going to go through many uh, topics. I'm first going to talk a little bit about, I'm going to summarize some of the uh, topics that I went through in the last two presentations I gave to you because that helps set, set the stage for tonight's presentation. I'm then going to give a little bit of more background information on the water and wastewater utility because it's very important for you to understand the system as it exists today in order to make the kind of decisions we're asking you to make. Then I'm going to dive right into the wastewater utility, figuratively speaking, of course, and um, talk about your cost of service and the recommended rate plan that we've set out for you tonight. We're then going to talk about the water utility, the same thing, cost of service and rate plan. Then uh, JoLynn is going to talk very briefly about your non-rate revenues, which while it is not a great revenue source, it's still you know, a fairly significant revenue source that needs to be taken into consideration in this long-term financial plan. And then we'll summarize and talk a little bit about the next steps in the process. So what have we talked about before up until now? Well, um, the city of Goodyear is a large city. It's a complicated city. And so uh, rate making is fairly complicated also, although some of the topics are, are fairly straightforward. So I think it was a very beneficial to, over the last several months, to sort of roll out the rate presentation in a series of stages. In the first presentation that I gave you all in um, December of 2004, I first started talking a little bit about water and wastewater rates in the United States. Um, where rates are going, how rates are going up for everybody at a rate of 5 to 6% a year. I then talked a little bit about ownership. Most water and wastewater utilities in the United States are publicly owned. There are some privately owned, but water is considered to be a public resource and a public utility, and therefore, for the most part, is owned and managed by the public. I then talked a little bit about the City of Goodyear's utility, its financial background. Bottom line is you're in good financial condition, but uh, important decisions need to be made in order to keep you in good financial condition in the coming years. And then finally, I spent a little bit of time talking about the concept of cost of service and how rates are calculated. In the um, February presentation, I went into a little bit more detail on some of these topics. I first talked about some of the realities facing people in your position. Um, you have a difficult position right now. You're asking people to do something that they don't want to do, pay more for a service that they've been used to paying very little for in the past. Heck, nobody wants to pay more for anything 
at any time for any reason. And so when you start talking about increasing fees and increasing rates, the first reaction most people are going to have is, heck no, why should I pay more? And so it is important to understand not only what the realities are, but what, how other people are facing it as well. I then spent a little bit more time talking about components of cost of service. What, what is cost of service? Well, you can summarize uh, the costs that a utility incurs in providing service in three components. One is your operating expenses, one is your debt service, and one is your transfers to the general fund. That's basically how cost of service is calculated. I then talked a little bit about your customer classes. Um, you have several different customer classes here. In other words, you've got different types of rate payers who have different patterns of usage, and that has a big impact on how rates and costs are ultimately tabulated. And then I talked about some alternatives you have for future rate design. So now we come to tonight. Before I get into the cost of service calculation, I want to recap a few of the uh, schedules that I provided at those first two presentations. This schedule right here shows the current water uh, and wastewater rate structure for the city. Like most, like virtually all cities in the country, you break down your rates into two components, <clears throat> base charges each month that people pay regardless of usage, and then a usage charge for every 1,000 gallons of uh, water and wastewater usage that they incur. Um, a basic rate payer here pays a, uh, who uses a three-quarter inch meter, and that's the vast majority of meters in your city, pays a base water charge of $11.24 and a base wastewater charge of $21.12. Many people ask the question, why should we pay a base charge at all? I mean, if I don't use any water, why should I pay anything? Well, the reason is very simple. The reason is that a significant portion of the costs that are incurred in providing water service are not in the water itself. It's in making the water available for people to use. You have to have a water system where any time of the day or night you turn that tap, water will come out of it. Any time you flush your toilet, you want the toilet to flush. And so there is a lot of cost that a city incurs in making that water available. And that is cost that will be incurred whether a city sells one gallon of water or one billion gallons of water. So that's why customer charges are a common occurrence. Um, if you have larger meters, you pay larger customer costs because the cost components of larger meters are greater than the cost components of smaller meters. As far as your volume rates are concerned, you have two basic types of customers. You've got residential customers and you've got everybody else. Your residential customers pay a rate based on an inverted block. In other words, the more they use, the more they pay. This is a very important policy guideline that the city long ago adopted. <clears throat> If you're a residential rate payer and you use between 0 and 6,000 gallons a month, you pay a rate of $1.30 per 1,000 gallons. If you use between 6 and 12,000 gallons, you pay $2.59. If you use between 12 and 30,000 gallons, you pay $3.89 per 1,000 gallons. And if you use above 30,000 gallons, you pay $6.25 per 1,000 gallons. There are many advantages to a rate structure like this. The first advantage is that it really does encourage conservation. There is no greater way to get people's attention and to get them to use water wisely than making them incur a financial penalty or disincentive for greater amounts of usage. So if you're a residential customer and you use 30,000 gallons or more, there aren't that many residential customers that use that much water, but there are some. You pay a lot for that water. It's available to you, but you pay an awful lot for it. The average residential ratepayer here in the city of Goodyear uses about seven to 8,000 gallons a month. So most ratepayers pay in the first and second tier there, but some ratepayers pay more. For your non-residential customers, they are right now also paying a tiered rate. If, um, you use, if you're a non-residential commercial customer and you use between zero and 40,000 gallons, you pay 330. If you use between 40 and 100,000, you pay 528. And above 100,000 gallons, you pay $6.86. Irrigation customers also pay a tiered rate. On the, on the wastewater side, as you can see, after the, after the base charge, res, wastewater customers pay a flat rate of $5.78 based on a winter average. This is the rate structure that is currently in place for uh, the city of Goodyear at this time. 
Now, what many people ask when they see a rate structure is, how much do people actually pay in a month? I don't really care what my unit rate is. And the analogy I like to use is, I'm a professional rate consultant. I live in Frisco, Texas, and I don't even know what my volume rate is in Frisco. I never bothered to find out, because I don't care. All I care about is what my monthly bill is. And I think that's true of most rate payers. The average residential rate payer uses about 7,000 gallons of water and has a winter average of about 5,000 gallons. That means that the average residential rate payer pays about $71.55 for that amount of usage. This chart compares usage in the city of Goodyear to many of your neighbors. As you can see from this chart, you're about where you would expect to be. You are higher than some of your other neighboring cities, but you're lower than others. You're right about at the state average. Um, you're lower than cities like Buckeye, you're lower than EPCOR, and you're lower than Liberty Water. But you are higher than, nominally higher, than a few other cities here um, in the valley. Now, a couple of things to keep in mind when you think about when you compare rates. The most important thing to keep in mind is this. 30 to 40 percent of utilities in the United States right now charge rates that don't cover their costs. What that means is that they have made the management decision that they are going to subsidize some of their uh, water usage from their general fund. So that way they get to keep their rates low. But it also means that some of their tax money is being used to support the water and sewer system. Now, there's nothing illegal about that. It's not necessarily good financial policy, but it is something that, customer, that cities do. So just because a city's rates are lower than yours does not necessarily mean their costs are lower than yours. Another thing to keep in mind, as Mr. Beckley indicated at the beginning of this presentation, many of these cities are either in the process of raising their rates or are evaluating whether or not to raise their rates. The average utility has been raising its rates by 5 to 6 percent every year. And so that pattern is, ex is expected to continue. So while you're facing some very difficult decisions right now, so are many, if not all, of your neighbors. Okay, a little bit more background information. Right now, your water utility has about 16,336 customers, and your wastewater utility has about 15,370. As you'd expect, the vast majority of your customers are residential. See, 15,000 of your 16,000 customers are residential. You've got a smattering of commercial church, industrial, and uh, other um, non-residential customers. And you've got about 403 irrigation customers. Um, on the wastewater side, once again, the vast majority of them are residential, with a smattering of non-residential customers at all. You're a good-sized utility, and you've got a large customer base, and you've got a customer base that expected to grow in the coming years. Um, in our rate study, one of the things that we did was we prepared a forecast, a long-term forecast of your utility in terms of what kind of growth you could be expected to incur in the next 10 years. Now, you know, growth is hard to project. Um, a lot of people back in 2007 made some growth projections that didn't exactly turn out to be right. Um, so growth is always going to be contingent on factors that are going to be beyond your control. Nonetheless, though, um, from the factors we evaluated in our study, we assume and we believe that your growth is going to be fairly robust over the next 10 years. You have 16,336 customers in the water department right now. We're projecting you're going to reach about 21,500 customers within 10 years. That's an average of about four to 500 accounts uh, every year. Same thing is true on the wastewater side. Now, there's benefits to that. One of the big benefits of growth is that every new account comes in is a new monthly charge. It's a new volume user. It's more, uh, it's more revenue for the city. Water and wastewater utilities operate on a principle known as economies of scale. The more customers you have, particularly in a fairly combined er or condensed area, the less it costs you to provide service to each of those customers. So a well-managed utility that manages its growth properly can benefit all of its ratepayers over the long term. At the same time, when you're doing a long-term forecast of your costs and your rates, it's important to take into consideration the fact that the utility as it exists tomorrow is not going to be the same as the utility as it exists today. And our study definitely takes that into consideration. Now, as far as volume usage is concerned, we're also projecting that your water usage is going to increase uh, in the next 10 years. 
This chart right here shows your current, your historical, current, and forecast water consumption for the next decade. The blue uh, bars are your historical usage. As you can see, your usage has actually been fairly flat over the last four years, it's been fairly constant. But we're projecting that as you grow over the next 10 years, you're going to slowly increase the amount of water that uh, your ratepayers consume. Once again, that's an important input into any long-term financial plan. Okay. Now, another thing to take into consideration when you're doing a long-term financial forecast is not only how much water ratepayers use, but how they use that water as well. This chart right here shows water consumption by usage clock. Now, the reason why this is interesting is that it tells you how people within certain customer classes are using water. Let's take our residential customers, for example. This chart shows us that 62% of the water consumption by your residential customers was in the bottom block, was in the zero to 6,000 gallon block. What that tells us is that there's a lot of ratepayers out there that don't use much water each month. They only use a few thousand gallons. Now, there are a few customers who use a lot of water. 2% of your uh, consumption was 30,000 gallons or more. So what, is this, what are these numbers telling us? What these numbers tell us is that it is very tempting for, for, for utilities to own, when they look at rate adjustments, to only want to increase the higher volume blocks because they figure, well, the people that use higher volume blocks, they're generally higher income, and so let's just make them pay more, and let's have the lower uh, income people who are typically, although not always, the lowest volume users, we'll have them pay a little less. Well, if only 2% of your volume is 30,000 gallons or more, that's not very much revenue. And so what that's telling us is that there's just not that much to be gained by, by disproportionately increasing a rate on the higher volume uh, users because there's really not many of them. This also tells you that for the most part, your residential customers use water pretty wisely. You know, um, the 98% of your residential water volume is 30,000 gallons or below. I think that's pretty impressive. On the commercial side, as you can see, the numbers are a little bit more evened out. You've got some large volume commercial users. As you can see, almost half your commercial volume is more than 100,000 gallons a month. On the schools, um, same thing. About a third of your volume is 100,000 gallons or more a month. And on the multifamily, almost two-thirds or over two-thirds of your volumes is more than 100,000 gallons a month. These are factors, once again, to take into consideration when you look at a long-term rate and financial plan. Okay. What kind of plan are we proposing for you tonight? Our proposal is as follows. We would like to propose that you consider implementing what we call a multi-year rate plan for the water and wastewater utility. What it means is that you would implement a, a plan where rate adjustments are automatic and would be effective on January 1st of each year between the year 2016 and the, tw and the year 2020. Um, City councils, in our experience, tend to really like these kind of rate plans because what they do is they pass one ordinance, one vote, one time. And then on January 1st of 2016, the rates go up. On January 1st of 2017, they go up again. 18, 19, and 20, they go up automatically each of the years. The rate plans are designed to ensure that the city, that the rate payers pay the cost of service that the water utility in, uh, incurs. It also attempts, to the best extent possible, to phase in rate adjustments over a longer period of time. Um, that minimizes the, helps to try to minimize the impact of rate adjustments on your rate payers. So that is the plan that we're going to adjust, uh, recommend to you. What we're talking about is a five-year plan. You have flexibility as a committee, and the city council certainly has flexibility too. You could decide that you only want to recommend a three-year plan. You could decide you only want to recommend a one-year plan. But you could also recommend that you implement the entire five-year plan. Once again, there is a significant amount of discretion available for you in this long-term plan. So let's get into the guts of the plan itself. Let's first talk about the wastewater utility, and then we'll talk about the water utility. Okay. 
I wanted to put this chart in first to kind of summarize where we're going with your costs and with your rates. You see, this is the reason why. It is very tempting to think that when you do a long-term rate plan that there's only one option and a rate plan is based on some complicated spreadsheet financial model where you input a bunch of numbers and the rates automatically spit themselves out. Well, you know, obviously financial models are used in the development of rate plans, but there's a lot more to it than that. There is a lot of input and policy decisions that a city makes that are going to ultimately influence what the rate plan is going to be. The decisions that you make as a committee, as a city staff, and as a city council makes regards to, with regards to how you want to fund your water and wastewater utility is going to have a critical impact on what your rates ultimately are. What I say in the chart is this. The wastewater utility cost of service and the rate plan ultimately adopted will reflect the decisions that the city makes regards, regarding how you're going to fund four critical categories of expenses. There are four things we're going to talk about. The first is your existing budget expenses. You've got a budget out there. You've got a budget for the current year. And we've got to see how that budget goes up over the next few years. And then the second category is known as budget supplementals. That's additional funding that is needed to meet some of the goals that you and your staff have set for yourselves. A third component are the capital improvements that was outlined in such thorough detail by Corolla in the last couple of uh, uh, presentations. Wow, how much capital improvements are there, are there and when do they have to be made? And the fourth category is oversizing of your lines and, and your unfunded impact fees. So let's go through each of these four categories, and I'll show you how it ultimately impacts your rate plan. Okay? The first category is your existing budget. Okay? The city adopted a budget for fiscal year 2015. That budget is currently in place. The city is now working on a new budget for 2016 and beyond. Now, our rate plan is a five-year plan. So one of our key one of the key components in developing this rate plan is trying to figure out where your budget is going to go over the next five years. Well, we don't know that for certain. All we can do is make a series of assumptions about where we think expenses are going to go over the next five years. I mean, a, a, a forecast, a financial forecast is not a guarantee. It is a prediction based on a series of reasonable assumptions. What are the reasonable assumptions we use with regards to your expenses over the next five years? Well, the first assumption we're, uh, we're making is that most of your operating expenses are going to continue to go up at a pace of 3 to 5% a year. It's a reasonable assumption because basically the cost of everything goes up by 3% a year just due to inflation. Some of your costs, however, like chemicals, electricity, insurance, workers' compensation, some of those are expected to go up at higher rates than 3% a year. Um, our model reflects that assumption as well because I think it's reasonable to assume that something like electricity and something like insurance costs are going to go up at a rate of maybe as much as 5 to 7% a year. A well thought out financial plan takes that into consideration and ours does that. Another thing to keep in mind is that as your system grows, you're going to incur additional expenses. As your volumes get greater, as the number of customers increase, Expenses are going to increase accordingly. That obviously makes sense. It costs more to run a utility that's got 20,000 customers than a utility that has 15,000 customers. Now, another uh, important um, assumption is that your existing debt service is going to remain fairly constant. And that's an advantage for you because you've got debt out there right now that has funded some of your capital improvements. But the debt service schedules over the next five years are going to be fairly consistent. That's not true for all cities. There's a lot of cities out there that what they like to do is they like to backload all their debt. And so that way they can keep their costs lower in the early years. But what happens is as time inevitably marches on, sooner or later you get into those years where your uh, debt service payments go way up. You don't have that situation right now. Your debt service is very flat. And then finally, we're making the assumption based on extensive series of discussions with staff uh, that you're going to be adding some additional personnel. And these personnel will help you meet not only your current workload, 
but also your forecast workload. Now those assumptions are going to be true for both the water utility and the wastewater utility. We think they're a fairly reasonable set of assumptions. Um, I want to talk about the personnel a little bit more. Um, this chart right here is the forecast of your personnel FTEs or full-time equivalents. In other words, how many people do you need to run the wastewater utility? In the year 2016, you've got a total of about 21.8 full-time equivalents running the utility. It is being projected by us and city staff that that number is going to increase to about 28.8 uh, personnel by the year 2020. That makes sense. You're going to have about um, almost 3,000 more customers. So if you're going to have 3,000 more customers, you're going to need to have additional personnel in order to meet those requirements. Um, we're looking at increases in each of the wastewater treatment plants. We're looking at a few more collection operators. But, however, your administration people are going to stay basically the same, and environmental quality would only need to be increased by one personnel. So, once again, any financial plan has to take into consideration the fact that some of these costs that are not being incurred today are going to be incurred tomorrow. So, this chart right here shows you the expected budget expenses over the next five years. In the wastewater utility, your total existing budget is just south of $14 million. It's costing you about $14 million to run your wastewater utility. That's composed of about $5.5 million in personnel and operating costs, about $1.8 million in capital outlays, about $5.3 million in debt service, and about $1.2 million in transfers to the general fund. And as you can see, over the next five years, that number is expected to slowly increase by about, it's actually going to go down a little bit in the year 2016. The reason for that is your capital outlays fluctuate a little bit over the next few years. Capital outlays are, are items are of expense that you incur for capital items that you don't issue debt for, or for things like trucks and computer systems and pumps and that kind of thing. A, a city doesn't issue a bond to pay for a truck. They pay for the capital outlay out of their rate revenue. But those numbers fluctuate a little bit because there is some discretion among the city staff as to regards to exactly when they make some of those expenditures. But as you can see, over the long term, your budget expenses are expected to go up a little bit. However, the need for a long-term rate plan is not only to fund these additional budgeted expenses, but also to fund some of these expenses here that are currently not being accounted for under your cost of service. They include your budget supplementals, your new debt service to pay for your future CIP, and your oversizing of lines and unfunded impact fees. Let's go through each of those in the next couple of slides. This chart right here estimates your budget supplementals over the next five years. There's two categories of supplementals. There's the ongoing supplementals, and then there's the one-time supplementals. And I know that the uh, water and wastewater utility staff are here to answer any questions that you might have about what exactly some of those expenditures are going to. But the bottom line is that the city staff has <coughs> estimated the need for about $1.2 to $1.3 million in budget supplementals each year over the next five years. As you can see, about $700,000 in 2016, going up to about $1.2 million in each year after that. So that's an added cost that has to be accounted for in the rate plan. Now, the next category is your capital improvements. As has been gone over fairly extensively in the last couple of meetings, the city has identified in the wastewater plan approximately $12.5 million of unfunded wastewater capital improvements with city-identified projects of $5.9 million for a total of $18.4 million in future capital improvements. Now, that sounds like a lot of money, and it is a lot of money. $18.4 million is a fairly significant expenditure. But the thing to keep in mind is that you've got a large city with a very, very expensive water and wastewater system. It costs a lot of money to build, manage, maintain, operate, repair, and replace a water and a wastewater system. How much, how much does it cost right now? Well, right now you have a system that has a depreciable 
a value of $272 million. That's how much you've got in the ground in the city of Goodyear to manage your water and wastewater system. So when you consider the fact that you've got a $272 million system here, the fact that you're forecasting $18 million in wastewater expenditures over the next five years helps to kind of put things a little bit more in perspective, I think. Suddenly, the idea of spending $18 million on a $272 million system seems to make a little bit more sense. At the same time, you're looking at a water CIP of about $39 million. So you've got $57 million in water and wastewater capital needs over the next five years. That amounts to less than 20% of your water and wastewater system as it exists out there right now. Now, capital improvement plans impact your rates in two ways. How much money do you have to spend and when do you have to spend it? That's why it's important to look at not only your total level of capital expenditures, but the years that you believe that those expenditures will need to be incurred. Because that will drive when you would have to issue debt in order to pay for those capital improvements. This chart right here shows wastewater capital improvement needs on an annual basis between the years 2016 and 2020. As you can see, the total is $18.4 million. But as you can see, $10 million of it is needed in the next two years. <laughs> about $3 million in 2016 and about $7 million in 2017, with the remaining in 2018, 2019, and 2020. What that tells us is that we've got to issue debt pretty quickly to start paying for some of these um, projects. And we can't issue the debt unless we've got a rate plan in place that will enable us to repay that debt, because otherwise we won't be able to issue, or nobody will, will lend us any money. So we know we've got not only $18 million of capital needs, but $10 million of the 18 within the next two years. So how are you going to fund the uh, $18 million? Well, the city's going to fund its long-term capital improvement plan through a combination of four things. One is your current rates. Some of, your, and some of these capital improvement needs can be funded through, your, through the revenue that you generate on an annual basis from your rates. You also have a fund balance. You know, it's, it's your unrestricted fund balance. It, is, it exists. All utilities have it. It's sort of like a savings account. Well, the great thing about savings accounts is that they can be sometimes used to help fund projects that of, of a nature like capital improvements. And by drawing down strategically your fund balance, you can minimize the impact of these capital improvements on your ratepayers. But you have to be very discreet and very delicate about that. You don't want to draw the fund balance down too far because that's your rainy day fund. And that's money you need for in case of an emergency or a other uh, thing of that nature. So you, know, you have a very capable and competent finance staff right here. And I'm not just saying that because he's sitting next to me. Uh, but it is very important. But I think that you have done a very good job historically of managing your cash balances, but and that will help you in the long run with a rate plan that will minimize the impact on your rate payers. Another um, source of revenue is your impact fees. Impact fees have, are, are an excellent source of revenue that is used to fund future capital improvements. But remember, impact fees can only fund growth-related capital improvements. They can't fund replacement or maintenance-related capital improvements. And so, and the final is your long-term debt. In other words, what you can't fund through these three, you've got to fund through the long-term debt. Now, I won't go through the long and drawn-out process of how we arrived at this number, but through an extensive series of discussions with your city staff, we arrived at the estimate that the city will need to issue about $7.5 million in wastewater-related long-term debt in the year, fiscal year 2016. We're projecting you're going to need one wastewater bond issue of $7.5 million in 2016 to fund your wastewater-related capital needs over the next five years. This chart right here shows you what the um, long-term principal and interest will be of that. You see, um, you're actually, we're actually projecting that you're going to issue $14.5 million in debt in 2016. Seven million of that will be for water, which we'll talk about a little later, and the other seven and a half million dollars of debt will be for wastewater. 
the wastewater portion of your annual principal and interest will be about $433,000 a year. Um, that's assuming a 30-year note at 4% interest. So your rate plan has to incorporate the expectation that beginning in the fiscal year 2017, you will, be able, you will have to fund about $433,000 in debt service. Now, this is a five-year rate plan. Your long-term capital improvements will be a continuing process. In the next five years after that, you're going to need to do more capital improvements. And so I included in here the expectation or the belief that we think, based on our rate plan, that by the year 2023, you're probably going to have to issue some more wastewater debt, probably as much as $15 million. That's not, a, not going to impact this five-year plan, but it helps you understand and realize that Keeping rates at a point where you can fund all your costs is always going to be an ongoing process because there will be future needs that you're going to have to account for as the years go on. Okay, the final, the final category of additional expense is your impact fee credits and your line oversizing. The impact fee credits are calculated or forecast to be about $671,000 a year, and your line oversizing is... a begins at $500,000 a year in 2016 and 2017, and then goes up to $750,000 a year in 2018 and, 20, uh, and beyond. What that is, is that's an additional $1 to $1.5 million in costs. So what does all this mean? This chart right here shows you the impact of these rational managerial and policy decisions on your long-term wastewater cost of service. Remember how I told you earlier that your total cost of service was just south of $14 million, $13.9 million in the current year 2015? Well, if you don't do any of the supplementals or the debt service or the oversizing, then your cost is still going to go up to $16 million. But look what happens when you add these additional requirements onto your cost of service. In 2016, you're adding almost $700,000 of budget supplementals and about $1.1 million of impact fees, uh, unfunded, uh, of oversizing and impact fees. So that takes your cost of service up to $15 million. By 2017, your cost of service goes up to $17 million. And by 2020, the cost of service goes up to $19 million. So what you've basically done is by looking and agreeing to fund these additional uh, needs, you're taking your cost of service up by an additional two to three million dollars a year. That has to be accounted for and has to be incorporated into any long-term rate plan. So we're at the first point where we, uh, uh, where we thought it might be prudent to stop and um, allow the opportunity to ask any questions. So um, at this point in time, do you uh, have any questions about any of the numbers you've seen? Uh, committee Member Manerick? I do. You will. On page uh, 29, you just talked about unfunded capital improvements. Right. And your bottom number there is 18.4. Right. The last meeting <coughs> on the CIP, I saw a number of 40 million. Where's the disconnect? 40 million in wastewater only? I'm talking about a five year CIP capital improvement plan. They were talking about, so am I missing something about all those projects that um, they talk? Well, that includes water. This is only wastewater. That's all you're talking about. Okay. Right now. We'll talk about water next. Okay. So this rate plan is only about wastewater. Correct. This is the wastewater portion of the We got more coming. Right. Okay. So mm -hmm. I, okay. So that's where I missed it. Okay. okay. So that capital improvement money yeah, mm -hmm. will be doubled for the next time. Um, we'll have another shot of. Beyond five years? No, no. Uh, uh, Beyond when we the do... $18 million you just put up there. Right. There will, be, there will be more capital improvements when we talk about the water plan. Right. A capital improvement plan is typically the greatest single impact on a long-term uh, right. water and wastewater rate plan. Okay. So this number was just wastewater, so only right. half the number, and that's the disconnect between what you're saying right now and what I heard last month. That's correct. Okay. So there is consistency. <laughs> I just haven't heard the whole story. We, we hope so. Thank you. <clears throat> Yeah, I didn't know if maybe I should just go around. Do you mind if I just go around? Round table works well. It seems like several. Did that work better? Okay. 
I'll, then I'll start with you. I didn't mean to catch you off guard. Committee Member Passion, did you have any questions or comments? Um, not right now, I'm still absorbing. All right, that's fine. Uh, Committee Member Hinman. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, on page 21, um, it talks about the water consumption by usage, by tier. Um, the multifamily caught my attention. Uh, I'm sure many of you would suspect. Um, can you shed a little light on, on this tier structure? You know, on its face value, it would appear that multifamily customers or apartment customers are essentially water hogs. Um, but I think if you actually examined it, you would find that you had, in that, in that 100,000 plus tier, you may be servicing 100 individual units or 150 units. Um, can you talk about perhaps what the average consumption is for a typical apartment in Goodyear, or if you don't have that exact information, perhaps what the yeah. typical consumption is in other cities that you... Sure, sure. Um, what, what this chart really illustrates is the challenges faced by having a tiered rate for, for non-residential customers. Having a tiered rate for residential customers makes a lot of intrinsic sense because what you're trying to do is you are trying to achieve a policy objective. You're trying to get people to use a little less water. And so residential customers have a fairly significant degree of what we call discretionary water usage, lawn watering, car washing, filling a swimming pool, that kind of thing. That's why when a city puts in an inverted block or conservation rate for a residential customer, it can be very successful. Because if there is a greater financial price to pay, it's going to make you maybe water your lawn twice a week instead of four times a week. With commercial and non-residential customers, it's more of a challenge because commercial customers tend to use the water that they consume for business purposes. So they don't have as the, the same degree of ability to conserve water that residential customer have, customers have. With multifamily customers, you have a lot of multifamily customers in a unit. And so the individual customers are, tend to be very prudent water users. Uh, you know, a person living in an apartment doesn't use very much water because all they're using is the water that they need literally for survival purposes, for drinking and bathing and washing dishes. They don't, a person in an apartment, by definition, doesn't use water outdoors because he doesn't have an outdoors. So they're very prudent users. However, if you have 100 units then you're going to have a multifamily complex that's always going to be using a lot of water. Even though individually they don't use very much, collectively they use a lot. <clears throat> but that's, that's why what you're, what you're seeing here is a phenomenon where many of your multifamily customers are large apartment complexes, and they by definition are going to use large amounts of water. So they're going to be paying a higher rate for that. That is something to consider when you look at the policy implications of... of um, water usage, particularly when you talk about non-residential customers, for commercial customers, a high volume user is not by definition a water waster, is not by definition a water hog. Classic example of this is Campbell's Soup. Let's say Campbell's Soup came in and built a factory in, your, in the city of Goodyear. Well, heck, they could use a million gallons of water a month. Would they be defined as water hogs? No. No, they're not, because what they're doing is they're, they're making a product with the water that they use. So I think it's very important to make that distinction. And I would not want to cast aspersions on any multifamily user or any multifamily account for being water wasters because they're certainly not. It's just, a, it's just how the rate is designed and the nature of a complex that has a lot of people that live in it. Does that answer your question? It does. Maybe it does. Okay. Did anyone have any questions about that answer? All right. Um, committee member uh, Wilson. Anything? <clears throat> did you have any? Did you have any questions or comments, committee member? Oh, excuse me, committee member Zednik. Yes, I, I too had the same question with that. Uh, the usage it did seem to jump out, but uh, I understand your explanation. At the very beginning of the presentation, you mentioned that. Uh, um, Utilities work on economy of scale. The more people you have, obviously, the more cost effective you can be. Yet on slide 25, it says certain expenses will increase in volumes and customers as volumes and customers increase, which
which is just the opposite of that. So I'm a little bit confused. Uh, does economy of scale, which I'm sure does apply, uh, but then in this particular aspect, you say, no, no it doesn't. Well, uh, actually, I don't, I don't think that's a fair characterization at that point. As utilities grow, their costs are going to be greater. But you see, a utility that grows from 10,000 customers to 20,000 customers is going to have more costs. But they're not going to have double the costs. They may have 50% more costs. So while their costs are going up, they're still capturing the economies of scale. Okay. It just seemed like you're talking not of both sides of your mouth, to be honest with you. Okay. Um, um, I, I wrote in notes that growth equals revenue, and more um, in an area, the less it costs to provide service. Per unit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It contradicts it a little bit there. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, on slide 27, I'm, I'm not done. Is that okay? That's, no, no, that's okay. I think no, she was no, just no. kind of adding yeah. to it no, so no, that way no. when she comes around. No, no, I, pre I appreciate that. Thank you. Did you. But did you want to respond further to that, Dan? Or Well, the, uh, again, you have to understand done? what economies of scale means. Economies of scale doesn't mean your costs go down. It means they don't go up at the same rate as the proportion of growth in your accounts. Um, it's sort of like a classic example of economies of scale is two people that live in a house together. Two people who live in a house together is much cheaper than two people living in homes apart. But two people living in a house together is more expensive than one person living in a house alone. It is, it's an economy of scale, but it's still more expense than it would be for one person living alone. That's the whole nature of economies of scale. Yeah, there's typically a graph that will show you and it'll cross where the economy of scale is no longer applicable. Yeah, and there are instances where economies of scale no longer no longer um, apply. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, like I said, it just uh, to you, to your point seemed a bit uh, mm -hmm. confusing. On on slide twenty seven, um, on under uh, two thousand sixteen, for the capital outlay, it's uh, seven hundred thirty eight thousand and some change. It's reduced significantly, as you mentioned, um, compared to the other years. Right. Would it be prudent or, or um, something to consider to keep that at about the same as the others? Uh, that way, you wouldn't see the as much fluctuation. Um, once again, that that is where that that is where you a city. A managed city has to reach consensus between its operating people and its financial people. You know, um, it's what, what's always interesting about managing a utility is that the operating people are always saying, we need this, we need that, you know, we need this uh, widget, we need that doohickey. And the financial people say, that's all well and good, but how are we going to pay for all this? So you have to have a balancing act between what the utility needs and what the utility can afford to spend. And so, yes, uh, you could certainly lessen the impact on your rates by keeping the capital outlays down. Yeah. However, the risk you run is that you're not going to have sufficient capital to make the repairs necessary to keep your system operating at, a, at, a, at the quality that your ratepayers expect. Well, no, I'm not suggesting no, you reduce it. I, I'm suggesting that you keep right. it up. Keep, keep it, so keep that it it's steady so that it would so, be the, the one mil, 1 1.7 yeah. mil across mm -hmm. the board. That way, you would have more of a flat line. Your proposal is to have a five-year flat plan. Right. Yet here, we seem to be deviating from that. Mm -hmm. So I would suggest that uh, that be a consideration anyhow. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, if I could, I, I think that, that that point on that, as we get through a little bit later in the evening when we get through the discussion and you've seen water, wastewater kind of combined, Let's have that conversation at that point in time because I think there's also going to be an issue working the other way that you're going to see some other costs that are front-end loaded that maybe can be smoothed out over a five-year period of time to help the first year from having a massive impact. So I'd like to ask that we keep that question kind of um, parked in the parking lot uh, for a bit because I think it's a very fair question. 
Um, and I uh, think I had one one other on slide 43. Oh or, yeah, um, not being a, a financial genius or proclaim to be, but um, for the uh, the year 17, 18, 19, and 20, we have un, under uh, principal and interest uh, 433,000. Um, is I guess we had the uh, 14 million, and we plan to pay it back at over those four years. Is that is that true or not? No, it's a 30-year note. It's a 30-year note. Well, then what? I guess I'm confused with this uh, 400 and. Uh, Thirty-three thousand dollars. What's that for? Then that says principal and interest. That's the annual principal and interest payment that you would make. That, oh, that we would pay. Right. Oh, mm -hmm. I see. Okay. So we're end up. We're going. We'll probably end up paying seventeen million for a uh, over those four years for the fourteen million note. No. If I add, add that up. It's not no. Um, if I could, okay. the four hundred and thirty-three dollars or a thousand. Excuse me. Is the annual principal and interest payment for a 30-year period of time on the wastewater portion of that borrowing. So wastewater would borrow $7.5 million, and they would pay $433,000 per year for 30 years, not for four years. This is just showing. This is just taking it out to four years. This is just okay. showing the four-year payments on that. But it would continue, of course, uh, for the remaining 26 years. Right. So that would be paying one point seven million on, right. instead of the seventeen seventeen million you said. Okay, thank you. Any further questions, committee member Bennett? All right, committee member Sharp. Well, my question um, pretty much is in alignment with um, Bill Sednick's comments um, because on slide twenty five, it was talked about existing debt service and transfers remain constant, mm -hmm. but yet on 30 on 31, we see that it really jumps in 2017, and and then it it drops back down again <laughs> considerably. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. so I I I guess we'll see how it evens out when we have the other discussions. You've managed to avoid a situation that a lot of cities find themselves in. What, what many cities have done is they have issued debt, but they have engineered it so that they've pushed many, much of their principal and interest into the back years. And so they pay a little. It's kind of like, you know, like those car loans where you, or the, that fur, those furniture loans where you pay nothing for the first 18 months and then you pay $2,000 a month or whatever it is. So, but... So what happens is a lot of cities find themselves with their current debt, the debt they've already issued, going up every year. You haven't done that. You have had very prudent financial management, and your debt for the bonds that you've already issued is going to stay flat. Now, you have to issue more debt in the future, and that's why your overall debt is going to go up. But you've avoided the, the, double, the double whammy that a lot of cities have run into where not only do they have to issue additional debt to pay for future capital improvements, but their existing debt is also going up. So the ratepayers get hammered twice. Your ratepayers only have one impact and not two. Yeah. Uh, Vice Chair Battern. Uh, just two quick ones. One, this is the second time you made the point about most cities subsidize their water and wastewater. And I 30 think, to 40%. And I think we clarified that last time with Larry that we more than cover the current expenses, plus can return 1.2 back to the city for services? That's correct. So I am I guess I'm just disconnected on why that keeps coming up. Is that, <clears throat> does that help the sales pitch, I guess? Well, I think it's important to keep things in perspective because I guarantee you when you go before the public with a long-term rate plan, one of the first questions that's going to come out of the audience is from somebody who's going to stand up and say, my sister lives in Glendale, and she doesn't pay anywhere near as much for her water as you do. Why are you people run so poorly? And so what we like to do, and, and also uh, another question or another comment that's often made is how burdensome our rates are. You know, every city's rates are burdensome, no matter how low they are. So I think it's very important for ratepayers to understand what's going on in the industry. And it's also very important for ratepayers to understand that just because another city's rates are lower than yours, it does not necessarily mean 
that they have a more efficient operation or they've got lower costs or anything like that. They may, but they, that's not always the case. So I think, I think understanding what's happening in the marketplace and understanding what's happening around the country is very important when you make these kind of critical decisions. And one other one we had discussed that there's the money has, or that the city does have an available money supply that could be used to help offset some of these charges and help lower that that shocker uh, sticker shock that people are going to have that I'm even feeling seeing this. That's and I right. know what what this stuff costs. You know, I do it daily. Um, do we have a rough figure on how much without obviously tapping all of our savings? Because that would not be in any way prudent. Do we have a number that the city is comfortable going? We have. $56 million in potential expenditures that we need to do, we can reduce that down to 46 and still have another 10 or $15 million left in the contingency. Uh, I, I'm going to go ahead and answer that. Um, in the wastewater <coughs> side is where we do have cash available. And that cash available, if you remember, the one chart showed about $18 million of capital improvement plan. Yeah, 18.4. But the next chart, the chart that talked about borrowing for, for the next five years is only seven and a half million. The difference between those two is cash that we already do have in the wastewater system only, but that cash is, is really what's making up that difference. So that's a very good question. So just to be clear, we have, there's about 7.5 that we could work with. Currently. Now there's about 11 million that is already built into this model of cash. Okay. So that's, it, it, that's brought down the total. It's brought it down to 7.5 gotcha. million. Gotcha. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah. And that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you. Chairman Columbia. Okay. So 2015 to 2020, we're looking at 5.57 million increase. Uh, last uh, last month, we were presented with a CFP project summary that is at fifty-seven point uh, three million dollars. Is your five point five seven million in that plan? And I'm not sure if you're the right person to answer. Maybe it's a Larry question more. I, I'm not sure where where is the five point five million coming from? Uh, I'm looking at uh, 2015 thirteen point eight uh, to an increase of nineteen point four. I'm sorry, on page thirty-five. Thirty-five. Okay, so right. we, we do see an increase, but my question is going to be on the CIP project summary we were presented right. last month. We've got $57.34 million we we're already talking right. about. Is this in addition to? Well, the, the $5 million increase is an increase in your overall costs, your operating costs. It's got to come from somewhere. Income. Right. Okay. The, the capital improvement parts is in the unfunded CIP portion because what, what you're doing is you're borrowing money to pay those capital improvements these large capital projects, these multi-million dollar capital projects. And what, how it impacts your rates is that since you're borrowing the money, you have to pay the money back each year. Sure. And so that debt service is how it impacts the rates. I guess where I'm going with this, it sounds like we've got more than $57.3 million to deal with here. You will eventually, yes. I mean, who's going to tell us what that number is? Well, I think this is was just the wastewater is? side, I think, That's, is what. There's more then. Right. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, a couple of things. One is that when we do water, and that was the question that was asked earlier, you'll see that there are capital expenditures for water that also, and that's close to $40 million just for water. The second is that what these schedules don't show, what, what he's showing you is the annual cost. But of the $18 million in wastewater, 11 million will come from cash that we have on hand, seven and a half million we will borrow. So that debt service is what we pay for over the next 30 years, but on this chart it only shows the first four years of that debt service. That's how that's being paid for. The same will happen when we get to water. Okay, I'll wait for the, for it's, the, for the rest of the presentation. It's kind of like... Um, you, you buy a house, okay? When you buy a house, if you, if you take a mortgage out in that house... Well, I clearly understand this. Right? Trust me. I'm yeah, just trying no. to get to the bottom numbers. I want to I wanna hear the big numbers. I heard $57 million last month. I'm hearing a little bit more. Mm -hmm. I guess I'll wait till the end of the presentation and hear what we got next. If I understood your question, 
the wastewater component of the 57 million is here. So that's, this is not additive. This is part of the original 57 million that you heard last year. There you week. go. That's all I had to say. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Sorry for uh, misleading you guys down there, but uh, he, he caught it right there. Thanks. Appreciate it. Committee Member Scheib. Thank you. The only question I have left to ask is, starting next year, one of the, imp along with the impact fee credits, you talk about line oversizing, uh, half a million the next two years and uh, three quarters of a million. Could you explain a little bit what you mean by line oversizing? Yeah, I, I think I, I can do that. Um, we have a lot of areas in, in Goodyear, if you will, where people will be developing and one particular developer will come in and they need to put lines to get water and or sewer to their property and they only need a certain size line to cover their property but but the line needs to be oversized to cover all the undeveloped property that's coming in between and we need to have a way of funding that cost of oversizing so that's what that allowance is and that's something that we can um, talk about also towards as as options of should that be phased in just a little bit more Thank you. That was it. Can, you, can you say that one more time? So you're saying, uh, Larry, if you could. Okay. Um, if, you, if you drive around Goodyear, you see a lot of uh, land that's still in agriculture. You'll see development, you know, that, that, that goes around it. Well, someone is developing their property. They may have to put water or sewer lines or both to their property to be able to service that property. Their need for that property might only be an 8-inch pipe or a 12-inch pipe or some, some size of pipe that they only need to service what they're developing. But there's vacant land between them and where they're connecting to that will develop. You don't want the next person to come in and put an 8-inch line right next to it. You want it oversized so that you can serve the other property. You can't hold the end property responsible for all of that, and this is just a means of providing the cash flow to be able to fund a portion of that. Did you want to follow up on yeah. that? In, in other words, the city is going to help by putting in larger lines all the way through that, so when these two pieces get developed, the lines are already big enough to handle those two parcels. That is correct. Back charge from that? We, we will, but you don't know when you're going to collect it. If, if, it, if one immediately d develops the next, you know, that, then you would get the back charge real quick. But uh, it can take a long time, too. Did you have a follow-on, Committee Member Zedney? Yeah. Uh, does, um, does the city then charge go back? And, uh, char when, when developer number two comes in, and we've already paid, you know, a portion of that line. Now, do we get that money back? or um, and, and why would the city front that money? I mean, I understand, you know, from a, a, a standpoint of, yeah, it makes sense to put one line in. But why would we want to front that money um, and, and uh, maybe not even see anything for 20 years? Well, and that's a very good question, and I think every time the issue comes up, you run into that issue of at what time frame are you going to do that? Because I think in your example, when you use 20 years as an example, if that's a reasonable expectation of when that property would develop, you would probably make the conscious decision not to oversize at that point because of just the time value of it. The problem is, is that when it happens and you put an additional line to the next property, we now have to maintain two lines instead of one. And you lose efficiencies in those lines. Now keep in mind, the half a million dollars is a small portion of the total cost that's being invested. This is only the incremental cost to upsize on those lines. And oftentimes that incremental cost might only be 10% of the cost of what's going in at that time. And then the question was asked, can we recover that? 
we often will put a line charge on that property to say, or on the other property to say, okay, when you develop, you're going to have to pay your proportionate share for one of those parcels in between, but we have to have a means of funding it we, because we don't know when it is going to happen 100% for sure. Vice Chair Battern, you had a follow on. Just a point of clarification also, for the growth to even occur, to bring in more commercial, to bring in more residential, we have to have that ability to service them. So if we put in the eight inch line, let's say, and that services a block or wildflower area, and that goes in there and we wanna bring in, especially any high end users, if we, if we don't have that capacity there, they're gonna go to the next city. So if we're not thinking ahead in that way of having the capacity, so when they come, we go, no problem, we got water, we got sewer, it's, and, and everything, what it costs today, will cost more down the road. So if we have to pull that line out to put a bigger one in later, we're actually doubling our expense. So, I, and I hope that helps clarify just a little bit of my limited understanding of how this stuff works. But we have to have that availability to even get people to want to move in, which is our end goal, because that's how we get that bigger base and we get the cost per unit down, hopefully. Thank you. Um, yeah. Committee Member Pankrazi, you had a follow on. I have a question. Yeah, uh, so isn't this a, a responsibility of planning and zoning and the city council making those decisions when a builder wants to come in? I mean, the, the planning and zoning and the builder can, I mean, and the city can, can make it a responsibility at that time when the new builder comes in to pick up these construction costs. Is that it? Yes. You know what I'm saying? It's in other words, to get the reimbursement? Yes. Yes, that, that would be, yes, the city council would adopt that policy and that charge so that the person wanting to build in that interim knows as they're making their plans, I have to pay this cost. And the builder pays the cost, is that correct? The builder, the developer, cost. whoever, the developer, yeah. yeah, whoever yeah. is yeah. is responsible for it. Yes. But we take over the lines after. Yes, those yeah. lines are dedicated to us at the time they're installed and tested and so forth. Yes, then so we the maintain them. A developer puts it in, but then we're responsible after it's installed. Yes. We were at committee member Scheid. Did you have more questions? All right, <laughs> Committee Member Menard, did you have any other? Already asked it. All right, Committee Member Zednick. Well, um, I have a comment on um, this page 16, the, um, just the, the tiers. Uh, for the residential, the 6,000 is the commercial tier, and then the water rate's only $1.30, and then you switch to the non-residential, 40,000 per thousand, and it's only three tiers. Almost a six times difference, and yet the rate is in here. Um, well, and then the 578 is always constant, and right? Because that's that's the wastewater rate, that's the wastewater. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, as far as the residential rate is concerned, uh, again. The, the, the policy decision was made a long time ago to try to the best extent possible encourage conservation. And so what, and so what that, so as you can see, the top tier is four times what the, uh, what the bottom tier is on residential. It's 400% greater than the, uh, than the bottom tier. On the non-residential rate, the, the tier differential is not percentage-wise as great. It's only 100% more. And so... Uh, for that reason, it, uh, for that reason, the residential rate is more encouraging of conservation than the commercial rate is. The other thing to keep in mind, and this is a very important thing, is that the volume rate is not the only rate somebody pays. Somebody pays a, if somebody uses 2,000 gallons of water a month, they're not paying $2.60. They're paying $2.60 plus $11.24. So they're actually paying $14.00 which is an effective rate of $7 per 1,000 gallons. So the fact, that, the fact that you've got minimum charges and most residential customers who, who don't use more than six or 7,000 gallons a month 
means that you can charge a pretty low volumetric rate to the residential customers and still recover your costs. Why are they constantly well, doing that? Right. Well, I mean, is that an automatic draw? Um, do you want to talk a little bit about how that was calculated? Yeah. Um, as, as we looked at, first of all, what that number is, is mm. the recovery of the, I'll call it the overhead charge that, the, that is incurred by general fund. The finance department, for example, does all of the billing for the water and sewer system. That's how that cost gets paid for. Uh, insurance is charged to the general fund, but it has to be reimbursed. As we were looking at this, the question, why is that constant, we, we could have done an analysis comparing to our five-year assumptions in the general fund. But we knew going forward in this that there are going to be a lot of issues to deal with as far as increasing costs. And to increase that cost at this point in time can seem prudent, given everything else we have to deal with. And that, that's why we decided just to keep it at, at today's level. We had, uh, in 2014, we had a rate hike. And this year, we had a rate hike. But it's Correct. been so low. Why is that? It's under the 3%. Latter part was two five. Uh, five for water and zero for wastewater. January first of twenty fourteen, no fifteen, we did a, a rate hike that was um, equivalent, intended to be an average of five percent, as I recall, but it was all applied towards water, because that was the area cash flow was the biggest problem. January one of two thousand thirteen. Uh, did we have one of 13? Yeah. Okay. That was the fourth year of the last study that had um, the rate increases. So it had a four-year increase built in on that particular study. We knew this study would not be done in time to meet January 1st of 2015. So we did something that was about at the 5% just to kind of keep us moving that direction. Any other questions? Many members at ten. Yes. The wastewater and drain based cost that is um, how how is that figured? Why is it the water? Well, well, I the guess. family that ha that you, that has twelve people in it uses more water than those wastewater and drain sewer. Well. This is one of those very delicate topics because you have to ask the question, how exactly do you conserve wastewater usage? Um, it's, uh, it's just, you, with, with water usage, there is a very key discretionary element yeah. among residential customers, watering their lawn or not. With wastewater, how do you encourage conservation of wastewater? Do you get people to, yeah, okay. let's not go any further. And we, okay. <laughs> Vice Chair Battern, one more, and I just want to clarify: oh, wastewater is what comes out of a restroom is 10% of what we get in a plant. So we get your your showers, your baths, your dishwashers, your laundry. That's 90% of the makeup. So maybe I'm sensitive about my field, but <laughs> realistically, that's that's still a valid question, I think, because you know it's not just that aspect of what comes back out of a house and goes to a treatment plant that we're talking about. We are talking about showers and everything else. Yes, ma'am. Lots more loads of laundry, a lot more people taking showers, so it's a valid question, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that most of the water is gray water. Yes, ma'am. But not really sewer. So, yeah, that's why it's not Chairman Columbia. Uh, something that uh, committee member Senek was saying over there uh, when we were talking about page uh, hold on, page uh, 16, and you kept saying encourages conservation. That's why the residential guy is basically paying more than the non-residential school or company, whatever that is. But then we have pictures on Lake Mead earlier showing how low it is. So I'm thinking that we should think as we're doing these rates 
and this plan, we should also think about encouraging conservation at the non-residential and uh, possibly the multifamily as well. I mean, we, we need to look at the whole package because it seems like the resi guys are getting hit the hardest on the rates. And that's a perfect segue to the next section. There we go. Okay, I so I'm going to let you go there, Dan, if, <laughs> if you don't mind. <laughs> Okay, um, hmm. the next section is where we talk about the actual proposed rate plan itself. We've been leading up to this all evening, so um, we'll, we will talk about the suggested rate plan. This is the proposal for the wastewater rate plan. Again, we'll talk about water in a few minutes. But in order to fund all the objectives that have been outlined in this study, as well as the capital improvements, uh, we would recommend that you implement the following plan. That effective January 1st of 2016, you increase the base charge from $21.12 to $22.60, with the other meter sizes going up proportionately. We would recommend taking the volume rate from $5.78 per 1,000 gallons to $6.18 a 1,000 gallons. In 2017, we would recommend taking the base charge to $24.18, with lesser increases to $25.87 in 2018, 2639 in 2019 and 2692 in 2020. The volume rate would go to 661 in 2017, 707, 721, and 735. Now, what does this mean in terms of what people would pay? Well, if you are a residential rate payer and you use 5,000 gallons a month, and that is a very typical wastewater winter average level here in the city of Goodyear. Right now, you're paying $50.02 for wastewater usage. Under this plan, that would go up by $3.48 a month, which is a 7% rate adjustment. In 2017, the adjustment would be $3.73. It would be $3.99 in 2018, followed by lesser increases of $1.22 to $1.23 in 2019 and 2020. The increases would be 7%, 7%, 7%, 2%, and 2%. Non-residential ratepayers who have larger volumes of usage would see proportionate increases as well. A $308 a month bill would go up by $21 in 2016, 20, uh, and with proportionate increases in the following years. Now, the question is, what, what does this get you? Because often ratepayers will ask, well, if I'm being asked to pay more, what do I get in return? Well, you get many things in return. First of all, you get a well-run system. You get a system that's financially viable. You get $18.5 million of capital improvements that are built, put right into your system and right into your community. It will improve the quality of service, and you will be building and constructing assets that not only will you be able to use, but your children and your grandchildren will be able to use them as well. It is never easy to ask ratepayers to pay more, but the rate adjustments that we, are, that we are recommending here will enable you to achieve all the objectives in the rate plan that we talked about, as well as all of the capital improvements that have been talked about in the last couple of months. So with that, there's another break for questions, but... Um, well, uh, I'm going to ask respectfully, is it okay with the committee if we move to the water utilities and then we can look at the w wastewater and water rates together as a whole? Is that all right? Just one, one oh, quick yes. question. Vice Is there a reason that they front loaded the 7% Correct. and then dropped yes. it down to 2? Yeah, the, the reason. Two the, five across the there's, board. A couple, there's a couple of reasons because, first of all, the debt has to be issued in 2016. So that's a half million dollar hit on your cost of service. And secondly, it assumes that you immediately begin funding the impact fee credits and the line oversizing as well as all the budget supplementals. And that brings to mind something that Larry had indicated earlier, because one potential option that you could look at is phasing in some of those, um, uh, some of those additional expenditures. If you were to phase in those expenditures over a number of years instead of doing it all at once, that would enable you to lessen the early year's rate adjustments. Uh, that's, that's where rate making becomes an art, not a science because the policy decisions you make will have a direct impact on the rate plan that you ultimately end up going with. And that will become even more pronounced on the water rate plan. Okay, the water rate plan 
is going to be influenced by the exact same factors. It's going to be influenced by your existing budget and how we think your budget personnel and operating expenditures will go up. It will be impacted by your cap water costs. That's the one area that's not, that doesn't apply to wastewater. Cap water applies only to well water. But the budget supplementals, the capital improvements, and the uh, impact fee reimbursements and line oversizing are going to have the same type of impact on the water utility as they have on the wastewater utility. Now, on the water utility, on the, on the, on the water utility budget expenses, we're making the same type of assumptions that we made for wastewater. Most expenses are going to go up 3 to 5% a year. Some expenses will increase as your volumes and as your customers increase. Some of your expenses will increase at greater than uh, the rate of inflation. Also, the water utility has projected a need to uh, hire uh, more personnel as well over the next five years. Right now, the water utility is projecting uh, a need to increase the number of full-time equivalents from 22.83 in 2016 to 38.83 in 2020. As you can see, it's an increase of four personnel in 2017, four personnel in 2018, uh, seven personnel in 2019, and one personnel in uh, 2020. Those additional people, it has been designated by staff and, uh, uh, and management as necessary in order to properly operate uh, the water utility. This chart right here, same, uh, same uh, structure as the uh, wastewater chart. As you can see, in the year 2015, it costs you about $12.4 million to run your water utility. That's made up of $5.7 million in personnel and operating, about a half a million dollars in capital outlays, five and a half million dollars in debt service, and $700,000 in transfers. The $12.4 million is expected to increase to $16.6 million by 2020. That is your typical budget expenses. The lion's share of the increase will be just in your personnel and operating uh, cost uh, increases. Your capital outlays, your debt service, and your transfers are expected to remain fairly constant over the next five years. Now let's see what the impact is going to be of these additional expenditures that are necessary, just, and reasonable in order to operate your water utility. The first is your cap water costs. And by an amazing coincidence, we've got the cap water expert in the audience here tonight, so uh, he's available to answer any questions you might have on, on this particular subject. Wave, Mark. <laughs> the um, cap water allocation costs are projected to go from $1.8 million to $2.7 million in 2020. We have made an adjustment since the first time that you saw some of these numbers. While the commodity costs are still projected to go from $1.8 to $2.7 million, you will see that the long-term financial forecast no longer includes the inclusion of free agent cap water costs. Those have been taken out. The net result is that the cost of service is benefited to the tune of about $1 to $1.2 million a year. It's still higher. It's going to be higher because of the need to fund the cap water obligations, but it's not as high as what was originally projected to this committee. The second uh, category is your budget supplementals. Just like on the wastewater, you're projected to have two types of budget supplementals. One is your ongoing, which are projected to be about six to $700,000 a year, and the other is your one-time or special supplementals, which for most years is projected to be $500,000. So that means that your budget supplementals are expected to be just about $1 to $1.1 million in most years of the uh, financial forecast. <clears throat> the next category is your unfunded capital improvements. And as you can see, the water needs are significantly greater than the wastewater needs. The water needs total $37.5 million over the next five years with about another $1.4 million in city direct funded capital improvement needs for a total of just about $39 million. You add the $39 million of water to the $18 million in wastewater and you've got a total of about $57 million in capital improvements. That is, like we talked about earlier in this presentation, a lot of need for the system. But you're also talking about a $272 million system here. So that helps put the capital improvement needs that you're facing in a little bit more perspective. 
How do you fund these capital improvement needs? Well, you, you need to fund them the same way you need to fund wastewater. You need to issue long-term debt. You can fund part of it partly through your current rates. You can fund it partly through your impact fees, but you have to fund a significant portion of it through the issuance of long-term debt. Through discussions with city staff, we have calculated that the city will have to issue approximately $41 million in water-related debt over the next five years. So you have $7.5 million in wastewater debt and $41 million in water debt. That's almost $50 million in debt that you will have to issue over the next five years to fund your capital improvement needs. Well, I'm not sure it takes a rate consultant to tell you that if you're facing a water utility that needs $50 million in capital improvement needs, that alone is going to you know, result in the need to, do, to implement some kind of long-term water and wastewater rate plan. And that doesn't even count the other expenditures like the cap water and the budget supplementals. Now, um, your capital improvement needs, as you can see, the lion's share of them will be in the years 2016, 2017, and 2018 with lesser amounts of capital improvement needs in 2019 and 2020. However, the large need for capital improvements and the large need for long-term debt means that if you employ some, some strategy in issuing your long-term debt, you can do it in a way that, to the best extent possible, minimizes the impact on the ratepayers. In other words, you see the need to issue $41 million in debt, but that doesn't mean you have to issue it all at once. You can phase it in over the next uh, several years. The longer it, well, you wait before you issue some debt, the longer it is before some of that debt starts to have principal and interest payments that come due, and the, and the longer you can phase in your long-term rate plan. This chart right here shows that we're projecting the need to issue about $7 million in water debt in 2016, with $9 million of water debt in 2017, $17 million in debt in 2018, $2 million in debt in 2019, and just under $6 million in debt in 2020. As you can see, with each of those, the debt service starts to phase in after the debt is issued, and your long-term debt from your future capital uh, long-term bonds goes from zero in 2016 to $400,000 in 2017 and all the way up to $2 million by the year 2020. It's phased in, but it is still a significant additional obligation that your water utility is facing over the next five years. The last is your impact fee credits and your line oversizing. That is an equivalent amount to what we are seeing on the wastewater side, about $1.2 to $1.4 million a year for each of the next five years. How does this impact your long-term cost of service? Well, this chart shows you that impact. Your cost of service is $12.4 million in the year 2015, as you can see here on page 51. In the year 2016, your cost of service is going to be composed of $13.3 million in existing budget expenses, followed by $4 million in cap water allocations, budget supplementals, and, and unfunded impact fees. That takes your cost of service from $12 million all the way up to $17 million in 2016. In 2017, we see it increase again. We see it increase for two reasons. One, your budget continues to go up. And two, so your long-term debt starts to, uh, starts to have principal and interest payments due. So now your, debt, now your cost of service goes up to $18 million by 2017. And it goes to $20 million by 2018 and to $23.9 million by 2020. So as you can see, the cumulative impact of all these adjustments to your budget means that your cost of service is basically going, is projected to double between now and the year 2020. So what does that mean to your rate plan? Should I stop here for questions or... Just look at I'm the going to ask first. the committee, do you want to stop here? The next piece is actually kind of the mm -hmm. big reveal, right? The water, the water rate. <laughs> yeah, plan, okay. Yes. So did you want to stop here for questions, or there's maybe three or four more slides? So we can go forward. Yeah, okay. okay. And then we can ask questions. All right, thanks. Now, before I show you the next slide, <laughs> I want to preface it by saying the following. Cut the hand out. <laughs>
Pam, don't look ahead. Um, it is important to keep something in perspective. Your water rates, particularly for your low volume customers, are actually pretty low right now. And so, your, uh, so what that means is that any increase of any magnitude at all is going to result in a large percentage increase. But I want you to, while we're going to show you all the information, because I think it's very important for you to keep that in perspective, I think the key number here is to look at what the increase is in terms of dollars as opposed to what the percentage increase is. It's sort of like if you had a rate that was $1 a month for water service and you increased it to $2 a month, well, that's a 100% increase, but it's a $1 a month increase. So with that prefaced, I'm going to talk about the rate plan here. We're projecting or we're recommending the following. On the water rate plan, we're recommending a couple of fairly significant increases in the year 2016 and 2017. We would recommend taking your base charge from $11.24 to $15.74, effective January 2016. We would recommend taking it to $17.71 in 2017 with increases to $18.06 in 2018, $18.42 in 2019, and $18.79 in 2020. So you see larger increases in the first two years with more modest increases in the next uh, three years. We also recommend that you establish something called a cap water charge. This cap water charge is intended to uh, recover only the cap water costs. It would be a separate charge. And that cap water charge, which is nothing right now because you don't have it, would be established at 80 cents per thousand gallons. So somebody using 5,000 gallons a month would pay $4 a month for cap water. As you can see, we're projecting that that, that water, that rate would go up from $0.80 cents to $1.10 by the year 2020. <coughs> for the residential customers, we would recommend taking the bottom tier from $1.30 to $1.82 in 2016 and to $2.05 in 2017 with much more modest increases in 2018, 2019, and 2020 with each of the higher tiers seeing proportionate increases. For your non-residential customers, you would see similar increases in magnitude. The current well, bottom tier of $3.30 per thousand gallons, we would recommend taking that to $4.62 in January 2016, and to $5.20 in 2017, $5.30 in 2018, $5.41 in 2019, and $5.52 in 2020 with irrigation rates seeing similar increases. Once again, the key question becomes, what is the impact on an actual monthly bill? Okay, if you are a current residential rate payer and you use 7,000 gallons a month, that is the average amount that a residential rate payer uses for water service here in the city of Goodyear. Right now, they're paying $24.22 a month for that service. Under this plan, that bill would go up to $39.52 in 2016. It would be an increase of $9 a month uh, on the cap water uh, on the base charge and $5.60 a month on the cap fee. This is a total increase of $15 a month. Uh, the second year, the increase would be about $5 a month. It would go from, to, from $39.52 to $44.47 with much more modest increases in the years 2018, 2019, and 2020. If you're a non-residential rate payer, right now you pay, and you use 50,000 gallons, which is about the average for non-residential rate payers, right now you pay $225.47 a month. That bill would go up by $130 a month to $355 a month. It would go up by $46 a month, or I'm sorry, $44 a month in 2017, and it would go up by $10 to $12 a month in each year after that. The percentage increases are significantly higher on the water side, just simply because you're starting from a very low base here. So before we get too wrapped up in the percentages, let's take a look and see what the overall impact would be. Because remember, somebody gets their monthly bill. <coughs> What they look at on their monthly bill is they look at the bottom line. They look at the water bill and the wastewater bill, and they want to know what their total bill is. And so that's why I generally am very hesitant to talk about percentages. Because if you talk about a 63% increase, the first thing somebody's going to think is, wow, my bill last year 
last month was $100, it's going to go up by $60 a month next year, next month. That, no, that's not true. Only the water portion of it goes up by that percentage. The rest of it doesn't. And so what does, what does this mean? If you're a user, if you're an average residential user, you use 7,000 gallons of water and 5,000 gallons of wastewater a month. You pay $24 on your water bill, and you pay $50 on your wastewater bill. So you're paying $74.24 a month. Your bill, your total bill, would go up by $18 a month. It would go from $74 to $93. That's a 25% increase, which still sounds high, but it's a lot lower than the water side increase percentage as well. The next month or the next year in 2017, it would go up by about another $8.5 a month to $101 a month. By 2018, it would go up by another $5 a month to $106 a month. 2019, $109. In 2020, it would go up by, uh, by another $2 a month. So what you're looking at is a rate plan that results in higher increases in the earlier years and much lower increases after the year 2018. What it also does is, once again, it enables you to fund all of the objectives that we've talked about in this committee in the last several months. It enables you to spend $55 million directly in your community in water and wastewater capital improvements. This will not only benefit you, but it will benefit future generations of people that reside in this community as well. It will enable you to fund all the oversizing. It will enable you to fund your cap water resources it will enable you to fund the inevitable cost increases in your budget, and it will enable you to, um, to, to continue to maintain a financially sound utility. It's never easy to ask ratepayers to pay more, but what they're getting in return is a number of objectives that are going to enable them to continue uh, receiving service of a, a very high quality from the city of Goodyear. Um, now, one thing to think about as we go through this plan is this is a proposed plan. This plan is not necessarily etched in stone, and there are the ability for you as a committee to make adjustments if you so choose and if you believe that uh, some adjustments would be fair, just, reasonable, and warranted by the circumstances. How could you, how could you make adjustments, and what, how would these adjustments benefit the uh, long-term rate plan? Well... One thing that you could do is you could, instead of well, funding all the cap water up front, maybe phase it in over a three to five year period. You would have to balance that with your cap water needs, but obviously if you spend less money on cap water uh, up front, that means your rate adjustments wouldn't be as high. Another thing is that we have proposed that the cap water charge be a separate charge. It doesn't have to be. You could always incorporate that into your base rate if you wanted to, or you could keep it as a separate charge. It's policy decision. Another thing you could do is, right now, all your non-residential customers, except for your irrigation customers, pay the same rate structure. You could have separate rate structures for commercial and multifamily customers. There are some cities out there that have a number of separate commercial uh, type classes. They even have separate rates for churches and schools. So that's another option that you could look at. Um, another thing I know that this committee has talked about a little bit is creating some type of separate charge for swimming pools, but we'd have to talk about that in a little bit more detail. Uh, another thing, another option for you to look at is, we touched on this a little bit earlier, is your commercial and your multifamily rates that are tiered rates right now, many cities do not charge tiered rates for commercial customers. They don't do that because they believe that because commercial customers have less ability to conserve water because the water they use is for business purposes, maybe it's more just, reasonable, and fair just to charge a flat rate per 1,000 gallons for commercial and multifamily customers. That is, once again, another policy option that you might want to consider. Um, you, could, uh, you could change some of the uh, thresholds for your conservation rates. You could change some of the blocks. You could uh, implement higher percentage increases for some of your commercial customers. So you've got some options here. If you look at the rate plan and you say, no, this isn't going to work, or no, we'd like to look at other alternatives, these are some of the alternatives that you can potentially look at. So um, at this point in time, I think, you know, question. definitely a qu next question. 
point. Right, we're, we're at that point. Do we want to start on this side this time? Committee Member Pankrazi? Questions? Oh, you're fine? Okay. All right. Committee Member Zednik? Well, I have a comment. Um, it looks like us current, we current residents are going to pay the higher the brunt of this. And as, as it goes down, the newer ones coming in are. It's just, I would rather see the rates rather than 25% the first year. You know, even now, I'm not going to tell you what the rates are today, but mm -hmm. to keep doing it, it's like this 2014 and 2015, the rates are pretty low, especially in 2014. I would rather see them more evenly spread mm -hmm. out than one block in mm -hmm. 2016 and then 2017, it goes down a little bit. And, and remember that well, for next time when we discuss. Our, our considerations. Uh, I, I, yeah, I, that is clear. That, that's a very reasonable reaction to a rate plan like this. This rate plan is front loaded. The brunt of the increases take place in the next two years. But a couple of things to keep in mind. First of all, the rates do go up. So there's not going to be a point where the rates are actually lower. Somebody who moves into Goodyear in 2018 would pay this rate structure uh, their, first, their first day. Secondly, actions have consequences. If you decide that you want to smooth out the rate increase, what it means is you'll have less revenue in 2016 and 2017 and less ability to fund capital projects and line oversizing and cap water. I mean, if you don't have the money, you can't pay for it. So it is a decision. It's an offset decision you have to make. How much are you willing to pay versus what do you need to pay for? It's, a dis it, it's one of the reasons this committee's here. Larry, you want to add something? Yeah, I, um, I'm sure I'm turning it on. I had it. There we go. This might work better. Okay. okay. Now I got them both going. I think on that, and as we go around, because there is obviously going to be a lot of reaction and discussion on this, and that's very important. Uh, I think some of that discussion, and that's what Teresa was hinting at a little bit, is to save for next week. Because uh, what I'm hearing you say is the well, well, but I, I'm thinking that let's get through the questions that the members have about the issue. That is, that is an issue that I think needs to be on the table for discussion, a very fair issue that needs to be discussed. But I, I was thinking that let's get, make sure we get all these questions answered and then Next week is when we can really get into what will the committee recommend and how would you want to do that. Obviously, any direction we could receive tonight would be helpful. I appreciate that, but you're just getting it the first time and need a little time, I think, to digest a bit of this. But that one is one. I think we want to keep that as a discussion point for next week or later this evening, one or the other. But as Teresa is going around now, let, let's try to keep it on the questions that you have to understand. But also, it doesn't hurt to raise the issues that you want considered, much as uh, uh, Member Zednik just did. Let's right. get those out on the table so we know what to think about over the next week. But I'm not sure we'll discuss all of them. Yes, and because that way you kind of know what each other are thinking. So, so the way you did just now, kind of let your your fellow committee members say, okay, that's on. That's a, an idea or a thought for consideration. So as you go back and kind of deliberate and read this all individually, you can go, okay, this is where we might be going. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. I, I really think the PAT needs to be separated out so that people can see that it's. Okay, thank you. And I do want to ask one question, just an administrative question then, Anna. So will they have the notes, or should they be taking notes on this, or will they have the meeting notes before next meeting so they can refresh their memory? Yes, I'll Okay, in time, okay. Um, uh, Committee Member Menarek, I think we're to you. I have, to the point you just raised, I will give my general thoughts, but I don't have a Particular questions, but there's information that I would like. I would like to know so that we can defend these things in the future, particularly <coughs> going back to page 17. Page 17, is that what you said? Yeah, all the way back. All the way back. 
because I understood it's not critical to have, it's not a question, but it talks, I think I understood that Goodyear pretty much, we cover our costs in full and all these other communities do not. I would like to know the percentage that other cities that are on that chart are subsidizing their rates. All right. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to clarify that, please. 30 to 40 percent of cities in the United States right now uh, charge rates that don't cover their costs. Right. That, that statistic comes right from the uh, Environmental Protection Agency. We don't know which cities cover their costs and which don't. You'd have to do a cost of service study for every study, well, for every city. I can assure you that not all of those cities are in a situation where they're not covering their costs. And that, that was never the intention of that chart. I don't know which of those cities are covering their costs, which aren't. I can tell you for sure Buckeye I know right that. now. I, no, I know that. All their costs. But I'd like, Buc but, but we, I think we'd like to know that. Well, sir, part, short of doing a cost of service study for every city, I can't tell you which specific city um, covers its costs and which specific city doesn't. I, I just don't have that information. I didn't know if you were going to do the answer, get the answer. There, again, so, so no short one, of doing a cost of service study for every city in the next week, which really isn't feasible, there's no way of knowing the answer to that question. I mean, okay, I, so we don't have it. That's okay. Right, so we, we don't have it, and right. we can't get it within the next week. Is, okay. Is there something else that would suffice, possibly? Uh, there's another thing that I would like to okay. know. Um, I would like to have the breakdowns by percentage. Um, this is possible. For 1,000 gallons of water, right now it's broken down by these tiers. Uh, we're at three, but we're setting our rates. I don't know what the page is, but it's, oh, there it is. Yeah, six, 12, 30. And then there was a chart about, you know, the percentage is really below 6,000 is the overwhelming number. But I would like that chart expanded. So the you, usage. The usage. So Do you if there's a 1,000 group, a 2,000 gallon group, a 3,000 group, cumulative chart with those percentages. Oh, of the use now. Yeah. Of how Goodyear residents use yeah. their water. Okay, is that available by chance? Like um, that would have to be extracted from the city's database. Yeah, I can't yeah. predict. Could that be done? So what do you want to see? How many customers? Yeah, so I have a cumulative distribution frequency and I add up to 100%, but yeah, that can't be that hard. He said he thinks they can do it. Yeah. I, I, yeah. Okay. okay. What volume? Or what oh, volume I'll tell it about 18. Yeah, about 18. 1,000. 1,000. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. And then to your question, yeah, um, my previous comments prior to were about conservation. Well, I agree with one committee member. My general thoughts are I think we should, should separate out the cap water charge so people can see it. I also think that we might consider separating out the debt service charge so people could see it. Um, also, I think the reason I asked that question is I think it's a possibility that we could hold rates constant for people who are really conserving water. That's why I wanted to have that breakdown. And if you want to be extravagant, well, we could have an exponential cur curve that goes up not just broken down at 6, 12, and 30, but broken up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And I also think that we should consider surcharges on people who have swimming pools and lawns. So those are my just general thoughts, committee members. Swimming pools and, and lawns, is that what you said? Pardon? So, so I, well, I, I didn't lawns. hear you. Lawns. Lawns, okay. I didn't hear you. Well, somebody else might think of other, but a surcharge. And I got a swimming pool, you know, and so hit Peter with, you know, a, a surcharge, 10 bucks a month or 20 bucks a month. Okay. Unless it's empty and then... Somebody from the city has to guarantee it's empty. Okay. Committee Member Scheid. Uh, I had a couple things. On your slide 56, which is the summary of the impact rates, mm -hmm. this is what it costs us for water and wastewater. I've seen my bill. There's a lot of taxes on there, too, and surcharges. Is there a way that we can get this chart supplement and actually show the true taxes on, on at the current city rates, current tax that we would pay? So what's actually, instead of paying 7424, what's the true customer seeing on the right bill. Now. Uh, if, I've got to relate it because you referred to the. There we go. 
you referred to the taxes. There's one other charge in an existing bill that most of us don't look. I always call mine the water bill, but it's water, sewer, and sanitation, right. which is $22 a month. So I think what I heard you say is, is what is that $74 a month paying for, including tax? Do you want to include all of that? Well, I was just kind of curious if, if well, along with city tax, so we're not actually paying seventy four twenty four for water sewer. We're paying seventy four twenty four plus the applicable taxes or impact that fees that go with that. Is that already included in that seventy four twenty four? The tax is not, not but tax. the other, the other, all the other costs are included there. The the sanitation or the garbage charge right. is not a course. So it's in just there. the standard city tax uh, yeah, it is, is not the, included. Yeah, the city city and state, I believe, tax okay. is included. You know what that there. total percentage would add up to? Uh, it would be two and a half. It's eight and a half, I believe. About eight and a half, ten. So if okay. Okay. So if there was a bill that was seventy four twenty four, about what would that be out the door? About seven forty about eighty one dollars around the Okay. Uh, the only other comment I kinda had too is in particular in the water, we're talking in two years a massive amount of capital improvement projects. I just was kind of something for food for thought for the staff. But they can come back to us and talk to us next week. Is it physically possible to do that many designs, that many IFB programs, to try and fund that many projects two years from now? Because I, I know what I know how long that would take in process. Um, so if we're being asked to front load our bills for the next two years to be able to start bonding for that, is it something they can take a look at doing $37, 40000000 dollars worth of capital improvement in two years? Because it's it's going to take well over a year in design for a lot of that. Yeah, is it achievable even? Just yeah. is, it, is, can it, it is it feasible that it can actually be done in the next three years? Okay. That was it. And you'll want that information next meeting? That you it's said just something that maybe they can kind of come back with a, com a, a possibly a comment or, you know, I know we would love to be able to do it, but is it is it possible with the current staff or the increase in stuff that they want? Okay. Thank you. And now did you want to see the tax thing? Next no, time, or, you, or that you, did that answer your you question? The question up, okay. I was trying to get a more clue of a, of a real bill. So if we're talking about going from 7424 and possibly now going into a $93 bill, we're really talking more like $105, $108 in, in true cost to the customer, not counting sanitation. Chairman Columbia? Uh, mine's more comments um, uh, along the lines of conservation. Um, I agree with uh, Committee Member Minerick uh, that uh, we should look at a surcharge uh, for swimming pools and lawns. I agree with that. Very good point. Uh, but I also think we should expand on some of that. Let's talk about some folks that use <coughs> past their allotment. If we think uh, someone's using, uh, on average, 5,000, and all of a sudden we start to see them go up to 10,000, will there be a fine associated with that? Or will it be called a surcharge? There should be something. I don't think we're visiting the conservation <coughs> enough. I don't see it in this, really. I think that's something we should all think about when we come back, uh, to this meeting on uh, next week. I'll come up with some ideas on that. Uh, Lake Mead looked pretty low, and I think uh, we need to have some more besides the ideas that uh, Minerick, uh, Committee Member Minerick, uh, brought up earlier. So it's just a comment. Okay, thank you. Right. Uh, Vice Chair Battern? Just a quick question about some staffing. I noticed we we're looking for by 2020 on slide 26 is seven extra people in the wastewater, and slide 42 was 16 extra people. Is that, did you guys pull those numbers based off the demand of the system at that time? Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, we're, the, what we're looking at is, you know, there, there is some uh, growth to the system that's going to occur that we have to plan for. Uh, we've, we're talking to developers right now uh, that are planning to come into the system over the next couple of years. And so that infrastructure is going to be built and has to be maintained. The difference between the water and the wastewater side is the fact that the water typically has more infrastructure parts, more valves, hydrants, things that need to be maintained than the wastewater side. That's why it's more front loaded on the, on the water side, or highly loaded on the water side. So, but it, just to be clear, then that's that's an estimation it, based off growth potential. Correct. So Through that number, estimation. both of those 
slots because they can be kind of pricey or variable. Correct. So we may need more or less. Um, also, have we looked at any other sources of funding for these projects, WIFA loans, um, grants, anything like that to help reduce this this capital cost? Because, and this will, I'll just finish it with my last point. When I saw the 25% increase next year, that that's a sticker shock for a lot of people. I'll be honest with you guys, you know, I'm trying to find a way to massage it. So it's, you know, people aren't going, well, this is crazy. I'm out of here. And that's actually several good questions that I think everyone feels. And I'll just tell you bluntly to answer that. The first numbers I saw, I had bigger sticker shock than you. So there. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, good, you're right. Yes. Okay. Good. <laughs> that's good. Want to make sure yeah. we're all in this together. Yes. Um, no, those are some good questions. As to the alternate um, funding sources, WIFA loans, for example, for us, they're really not on the table. Uh, they're kind of like uh, Henry Ford described in the, on the Model A that you can have a car any color you want as long as it's black. Well, in the WIFA loans, it's the same thing. It's, it's 20 years only. Uh, we do a lot of our, our infrastructure financing over a 30-year period of time. And, and that provides us better debt service ratios and so forth. As to grants, we have a grants person that's always looking. They take care of grants. Uh, we do have some in the water conservation. I think they've done a pretty good job. Um, but as, as to the impact on a lot of this infrastructure, I don't, I don't see any grants out there that, that would be an expectation coming in. And I think several of you, and one of your comments earlier did, and I think uh, one thing that we'll be able to talk about or discuss in some of that is, and it came to the first comment on this, is, is there a way of softening it in the first year and softening it over the five years so that it's more? When I first saw it, I think I did a calculation in that it's an average of nine and a half percent a year over the next five years. Is there a way that we can get closer to doing that than this huge sticker shock? And we're working on some alternatives, uh, or we're, we've talked about some alternatives in doing that, and I think we can go over those as, as, as we're moving forward on this, and as we have that dialogue, we can give you some of those. But it's hard to take that into consideration at, at this time point in time, right? Grants and, and that, I guess funding. that last statement was just more for what I'm feeling is a consensus and what I know they're going to do out there because I'd hate for them to come banging on City Hall with torches going, where's Larry? Let's or try Jason. to avoid that. <laughs> <laughs> or Larry who? I just have right. to make just one brief comment about yes. that. Is a, this is a very interesting decision that you all will make because there's really two schools of thought here. One school of thought is what we call the dental chair approach. Do it, get it over with in the next year or two. And then after that, you're only looking at very, very nominal increases. Some cities find that to be the, uh, the, best, the best way to go. Um, other cities say, no, we just think that's too, big a, uh, that's, too, that's too big a hill to climb. So uh, different cities will come to different answers about that question. And it'll be very interesting to see what, what the general consensus forms here on this committee. All right. But, uh, yes. Can I add to that? Yeah. Sure. Uh, one thing you were forgetting is how about the retirement communities? We've got a couple of them inside Goodyear. So, I mean, mm -hmm. taking a 25.3% increase in your monthly bills. Uh, sure. That's all part of the equation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. I had one quick question to follow up that. Is the reason why this, your recommendations are so front loaded, is it, is it going to help for the ability for the city to be able to get those capital improvement, those massive loans? Or is it just, because I, I, I kind of have the same feeling, we're going 25% the first year and we're doing 2.5% five years from now. Right. Why is this so front-loaded? It's the, the capital improvement is a big part of it, the, you know, the, the, the 50 plus million dollars in capital improvements. But it also assumes that you, ca you fund the cap water immediately and you fund the supplementals, all of them, right away, and you fund all of the um, line oversizing right away. It's funding everything right now. So... It's what I would call a worst-case scenario. So the, the benefit of showing you that option is that it does give you some flexibility if you choose 
if you decide that, they, that, that it's too big a hill to climb and that you'd like to phase in the adjustments, you have some room to maneuver. But also keep this in mind. If you decide that you want to phase in the increases over a longer period of time, it means you're not going to have as much money in the first couple of years. You will not be able to fully fund all the supplementals. You will not be able to fully fund all of the line oversizing in the first couple of years. You may decide that's a trade-off that's a worthwhile. It's your choice. Committee Member Sharp. Well, I have a, several comments um, <clears throat> and one question. Um, I think what we're going to need is a balancing act between the dire need, um, which we can get those answers from the engineering people, um, balanced with a reduction in that in those first couple of years. I agree, uh, but we did listen to some pretty dire circumstances with our wells. And so it's really going to be a balancing act, and we're going to need the professionals to tell us where that line can be drawn. So my question, my, the information that I want, <coughs> would like to have for the next meeting, is where can we get the improvements and reduce that rate and not put people in jeopardy or services in jeopardy. So I want them to draw a, a line in the sand, if you will, of what the most urgent need is and how we can draw that down with the rate structure de to decrease it. So <clears throat> we'll need the professional advice there. Um, the other thing is, my question is the cap fee. And I see that non-residential, and I assume that those cap fees are agriculture for the most part, probably, because agriculture is using the CAP. To my knowledge, no residential units are using CAP water because we can't treat it, right? So until residents guy. are using it, I'm wondering what they're paying for. Thanks for the question. Um, just to let you know, the CAP water is our replenish used for our replenishment obligation. So all customers in the entire city service area are using CAP. We're using that to replenish the groundwater we're pumping under state law. And so, all the wastewater is going there too. I'm sorry. You're replenishing the wastewater into the into the aquifer as well. Correct. We're, we're getting um, through the wastewater. We have a little discussion on that. We get about 40% back through the collection system of the entire water we deliver. We get about 40% back that is treated um, at the main Goodyear reclamation plant. The other two plants um, are having, they're using that, that reclaimed water for direct deliveries. So it's going for golf course lakes. It's going for uh, Estrella uh, Mountain Ranch for their uh, outdoor water use. So are you saying, Mark, that essentially every user would have that CAP charge? Every user is using CAP. Okay. Every user, okay. is that way you work to Dana, every user is having a CAP uh, surcharge or a charge? Yeah. yeah. That would and be. And that's how we're, the order you see uh, for 2016, that number for the CAP order is based on the entire city water demand. So we're ordering. So that's how you base it then on the entire demand. Correct. The city. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. And again, we, had t we touched on real briefly, and I won't take too much time. Um, we are banking the city's uh, reclaimed water from the Goodyear main reclamation plant into our bank account. And again, it goes back to, you saw some of the headlines, the CAP system will be shorted in the future. Someday, when it impacts municipal industrial users, we won't be able to order all of our water. Therefore, we're going to be into our bank account, and that's hopefully robust enough that we can draw on that, maybe if it's 10 years of drawing or 20 years, it's uncertain. But that's why we are trying to increase that bank account and ordering all of our water demand for CAP. And Committee Member Sharp, on your other request, did, did you understand what she wanted from that? So you wanted the... I want a balancing act between our dire needs and reducing the rates in 2016. And is that only capital projects, or are you thinking 
along. Well, I'm thinking capital projects because the wells are definitely the main problem in my estimation is we we have a problem with, you know, refurbishing and perhaps even having to drill new. Okay. Because I recall they had, uh, I recall that they, I thought they had kind of a first phase, didn't they, top priority? Uh, so that might be in Yeah, those. but that, that's figured into the economic structure too. Now if we want to reduce it, we need to know, we need to also reduce that as well. Okay. I just want to make sure that we have for you whatever it is we're looking for. So that yeah, Carl was left. I, I guess if I can try and clarify, so we can make sure we ask yeah. that question. Um, are, you, you said a line. Is that prioritizing projects that are dire? We right. need, and then what may be considered, I'll say, uh, somewhat less dire. I mean, it's if if we we, can, everything is dire. So you saw, I guess, but it's more or less. To, what right. is that line? Okay. The 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 problem is is that. Your growth, you're making the people that are living here right now paying the brunt of the, the increases in the rate structure. And the other people who are going to be moving here later get a smaller increase, you know, but the ones that are living here now are going to see the big rate hikes. Now, your capital improvement plans are figured into that. And so if we can cut back and, and reduce some of those to where we can also balance it with the rate structure, then I'm thinking you might be able to lower it. Because right now, everything's front-ended. And that's what I want to I want to see a more gradual, sustainable so, rate. OK, so what you're thinking is anything that um, could be forgone, if there's even such a thing, in the capital improvement plan, that's what you want to see. Right. And okay. if, I, if I could on that, just for clarification, within that report, and I think that's what you were referring to, they, they gave us slides that had three categories of, of order in it and the ramifications if we don't do each of those areas. And that might be the logical breaking point for the question that you're asking. What happens if we only do the... So I, I can't remember, was it called priority one yes. or phase exactly. one, two, and three, just breaking those out. Right. I think that's what you're asking that's for. That's what I'm asking for. Is okay. And then each one of those packages had um, the levels of services that would not be met with. If you did right. this one, what would not be met? The other one, which exactly. wouldn't be met? So. Okay. Uh, Vice Chair Banner, you had your... And just, just for my own clarification, I've, heard, I've thought I've heard a couple times, all these numbers that we're seeing tonight are based off all of our wishes being met, correct? correct? So this is best case scenario, worst price, but best coverage, I guess, that, that they've come up with. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I think that's a fair characterization. Okay. Um, is that it, Committee Member Sharp? Are you done? Yes. Are you complete? Uh, committee Member Zednick? Yeah, I think um, what, uh, what was said was uh, looking at uh, wants versus needs. You know, yeah, I want uh, okay. I want all this stuff here, and it's going to cost us, uh, you know, fifty five million dollars. What do I need? Okay. Not what I want. What do I need? <coughs> and I'd like to see a list of what do I need, not what do I want. Right. You see the list of what we want. I think that we need to uh, uh, take a realistic view of what do we actually need uh, to to move forward. A um, couple things that. Um, you know, we, we've seen a lot of numbers floating around from last week, uh, 60 million uh, or 59 million. Now it's uh, 40 or 55 million. And, and I still think that those numbers are probably understated uh, to an extent. But um, the population that, uh, that I've seen through some of these reports, they vary anywhere from, you know, uh, 49,000 to 74,000. So... So our population seems to be a variable too, which I don't understand. Um, so we're, we're asking to increase by 25% the water bills. We don't have, I, in my mind, a clear definition of uh, exactly what our population is because those numbers are variable and a clear understanding of what our cost is going to be because that number seems to be fluctuating yet. 
So why are we still giving away water to the, from the other two reclamation centers uh, to water the Goodyear Golf Course and uh, Estrella? I mean, not to sound rude or anything, but I'd say stop. Quit doing that. Charge the aquifers or charge them uh, for using that water. I mean, let's, let's be realistic. We're going to bang Peter over here and because he's got a swimming pool, and yet we're using all the or a, a huge number of uh, gallons of water from the reclamation centers to water a golf course. Oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, and so that's something you'd like the committee to consider. Well, I, I just, yeah, remember, just I like, think I think there was something sent out that said those are kind of the agreements that have already. Yeah, been they said point. they were agreements, but I mean, you know, that still wasn't clear in my mind. Okay. That still wasn't an adequate explanation. Okay. Uh, yes. yes. Well, yes, yeah. They are. yeah. They are agreements in Contracts. writing. For how long? And, For how, yeah. Uh, well, I don't know the how long in them. I, I think that they're the complexity of the agreements because there's a number of them. Also want, want to understand at the same time that there is $20 million of, in, of infrastructure that has been put in place by that same developer that future impact fees are owed to that developer to reimburse them. So if we unilaterally go in and cancel agreements, then what is the impact on that $20 million exposure too? It's very complicated as you get into agreements with, 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 um, with other people. Now, what I've been told is that as of today, none of that water that's coming out of those systems is going into the golf course. That is water that's coming out of wells that they own at this point in time, not out of our water system and not out of, um, um, out of the reclaimed water. That reclaimed water is now going down, down the wash. Is so that, that yeah, correct? Yeah, Mark, that's question. Oh, I thought that's what you we told me about. water plants in the inlet. Valley plant, all the oh, it does go. Okay, so the Rainbow Valley does. So, One but but back to the point. So you, that was something you wanted the, con yeah, the committee I, I just, to consider, I just, but I'd I'm just not. like to take another look at that. I mean, you know, okay. I understand everything's complicated, and and there's a lot of agreements out there, and mm -hmm. and you know, all, all these things. But guess what? I got to pay 25 percent more. I'm pissed, mm -hmm. quite honestly. And if I'm upset, and I think some of the other people are upset. Just think about those other people who are going to be looking for, you know, torches and stuff like that, and, and Mr. Lang. So uh, I, I just think that, that we need to use a little more common sense on this whole thing. I mean, I, I drove down that new road that we just put in there by the ball field. Nice road. I don't know that we needed it, but we put it in there. We've got landscaping like crazy in there, and we're watering it. Now, I don't care if it's desert. I don't care if it came from from Australia or wherever it came from. We're putting water in there, and, that, and we're using that water that should be charging the aquifers. Whether it's reclaimed water or, or whatever kind of water it is, it's water. Mm -hmm. And we ought to be putting that back into the aquifers. We're going to get Peter here. We're going to charge him. He's got a pool, but we're okay putting water out on plants there on board on a road that goes behind the ball field in case the Cleveland Indians get... Uh, get lost or something, they could follow the rope back to the stadium. So back with the same vein of conservation. Yeah, like we're supposed to be conserving water. Okay. I, you know, please don't tell me you're going to charge me $25 more or 25% more, and you're not going to tell me how you're going to conserve water. You haven't told me that. Please, but, please don't tell me that I'm going to have to pay more for the next few years, but you're not going to tell me how you're going to help us conserve water. Please don't do that, because that's not that's just not right. It's just not fair. Okay. Thank you. And I'm, I'm glad uh, committee member uh, Zedek went down that path. Again, we go through conservation. Uh, is there a clause, I mean, and you probably don't know this answer, in that contract that starts to talk about, are they the last ones to get the water? I mean, is this do, still the reclaimed water thing? Uh, the reclaimed water okay. thing. Are they Sorry, the last ones? Sure the or page. is there a cutoff? Is there, a, I mean, there must be something in that contract that says, stop. Curious. You don't have to answer that because I know the contract's not in front of you right now, but it would be something to look into. Again, conservation is very important, and I'm sure someone must have put something in that contract to talk about that. I'll have to 
check it out. I don't know. See if there's a sunset on that. I, I, I don't. I hate to spend much more time on that because I don't know that we get a big bang for our buck um, finding that fact, out today. The fact that they're using affluent on the golf course—that's a plus. Oh, it is a plus. Mm -hmm. Yes, but we could be using that water to recharge our aquifers. No, it is, it is a plus. I I agree with you. I'm going to move on if I may, because we still have another little portion of presentation as well. Um, Committee Member Wilson. Oh, okay, excuse me, Committee Member Wilson. Well, I'm going to need the next week just to look at all of this. It's a lot of information, yeah. right? I know. <laughs> okay, Committee Member Hinman? Uh, yes, just a quick comment. Um, you know, my interest on this committee has always been rate equity between the customer classes. Um, I specifically am interested, you know, single family pays X amount for water, an apartment customer should pay the mm -hmm. same amount per, per gallon. Which is why I was pleased to see the, the slide 57, because uh, it actually kind of it talks about some of the issues or some of the suggestions that I would probably have for this committee. Um, and that's the either bullet point three or bullet point five. That's create a separate rate class for multifamily customers or just eliminate the rate blocks for, for non residential altogether. Okay. Um, I would love to see what those numbers would, would pencil out to. Um, again, this kind of piggybacks on my, on my comments earlier on, on slide 21. We use considerably less water um, than a single family customer. <coughs> um, yet, because of the awkwardness of, an, of a, the entire non residential rate structure, where a lot of users are placed in this awkward rate structure, um, where, again, even though we use considerably less water, we're placed in this higher, typically, we pay in the third rate block structure. Um, sorry, I'm completely delirious. I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm probably not making sense. Um, but I can't put this all in writing for Anna, which makes it easier. Um, but anyways, that would be certainly my comment. I'd love to see what those rates would potentially pencil out. Um, and I don't know if I can do that okay. next week. I don't know. Is, he's asking if that's possible by next week. Oh. Yes. Um, it's just a few other things that I think I want to ask uh, Dan, kind of, of what, how much of this we can do. We had talked previously that uh, he could run that type of a calculation for the meeting next week so that you could see it. Uh, I want to talk to him about a few other things that have kind of come from your comments and try to, you know, collectively and try to look at how we can maybe apply to give you some impacts of cash flow impacts and, you know, maybe working on leveling it. And so in that context, both your comment as well as several of the others, we'll talk to Dan and see what we can get by next week back for you guys to look at to see if that makes sense. Mr. Chairman, can I ask a follow-up question to Mr. Hinman? Yes, Committee Member Just, Eric. Um, you brought the point up several times. Right. Just, and I know your business is multi-family housing. Mm -hmm. So how does that work? There's just one pipe coming in there, and you don't charge the individual residents, or you do charge well, the residents, but they're all getting charged a higher rate because of the one pipe that's going in. In effect, they're they're getting charged a higher rate because of uh, because of just the rate structure. To answer your first question, it kind of depends on the property. Um, to, there could be several meters going into the property master meters, and then the units feed off submeters to the individual units. Um, older properties, they could just the, the property manager could receive a bill, and then based off of statutes that are ena or enabling <coughs> legislation, basically it's a ratio utility billing system, they can divide up the utility bill to the customer. So it kind of depends on the property itself. Property yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure. Committee Member Passion. A um, uh, couple things. Uh, one comment is uh, you know, all of this uh, budgeting and everything, uh, I think we, we established. Uh, from Carrillo last week, last meeting, mm -hmm. that none of it addresses growth. So something has to be looked at there. And then um, <clears throat> uh, Committeeman Sharp uh, made a comment about you know the, the, the people that are that are going to move here down the road, um, kind of get away you know dirt free. Um, I think I think something should be uh, looked at like. Uh, uh, maybe a point of sale of housing that uh, uh, a fee is imposed to uh, pay for inf infrastructure or future growth uh, for purchase 
and also at point of sale um, uh, uh, deterioration fee or something uh, administrated a uh, one percent or a half one percent on a purchase a uh, half a percent on a sale you're going to generate some revenue there <clears throat> okay other thoughts or questions All right, are we going are we going to do the rest we're not we're going to hold off yeah we're uh, the last part of the presentation is dealt with non-rate revenues and we can take that off from this week because it's not it's not a critical component of the uh, rate plan okay <laughs> and we will do that bless you. oh bless you i think um we did have the one comment we'll just wait till after we're so uh, now it's time for questions from the public. Um, are there any comments, question cards? They're not here. Okay, here's the comment. Uh, we ask that you take in consideration to change the water rates from commercial to residential. We have been having issues retaining our residents at Desert Sage apartment homes. And that looks like it's coming from um, That's interesting. Anyways, uh, clear, uh, clear team, Corina, and um, I guess that's going to be questions for the city and for the uh, committee. So. Is that comment going to be verbatim in the minutes? Because if not, I'd like it to be read again. I'll read it again. Oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, we ask that you take in consideration to change the water rates from commercial to residential, period. We have been having issues retaining our residents at Desert Sage apartment homes. Oh, I do understand it. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Sure, no problem. Okay. Okay. Interesting enough, now it's time for information items. Does any, anyone on the committee have information that they'd like to share other than what we've talked about tonight? Yes, Mr. Chairman, just so we can stay here till midnight. Great. <laughs> no, just, I don't know if the, you... There was an article in the USA Today paper in the last week, one-page article on the back page of the main section, which talked about how Israel has addressed its dire situation. So if you go back just a few days, I think it was last uh, Friday, uh, it was in USA Today, one-page article how Israel, which lives in a desert, addressed its water problems mm -hmm. so it doesn't have a water shortage today. Very good article. Don't know if it's valid, don't know if it's true, but it made for interesting reading. Goes back to conservation. It. That's why I'm here. <laughs> okay. Yeah. If uh, we find it, the city said they'll look into it and put it on the website. So that's Thank a great. Thank you very article. much. Okay. Uh, I just want to make sure that everybody understands that we have uh, the next meeting, uh, May 19th at 6:30. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, it's everyone understands it's very important that you attend. I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, okay, well, the next meeting will be held Tuesday, May 19th at 2015, uh, 2015 at 6.30 p.m. It will be, sorry, I'm tired as well. <laughs> Jeez, a long day. Uh, there being no further business to discuss, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.